Good morning and a warm welcome to each and every one present over here, all the panelists and all the attendees. The topic today is current application of genetics in OBGYN routine practice. We as OBGYNs are taught genetics at a very cursory level in our postgraduate curriculum and in MBBS for that matter. There are so many theoretical aspects of it that we generally put this, try to brush this topic aside because it's very intimidating for uh, OBGYNs in general. But in this fast uh, changing pace of world, there are so many recent advances in this field. And we as OBGYNs find that we are always at a disadvantage. We are expected to know the details about genetics. We are the first points of contact for the patient. And yet we are so clueless about what to do, what is the next step, whom to refer to, whether we can allow the patient to just go back home or she needs further investigations. There is a lot of confusion among our minds. And that is the reason why uh, Dr. Snehal, Dr. Meenakshi, and Dr. Priya Darshini, and everybody at MedGenome have uh, decided to you know, uh, throw some light about what are the basic practical current applications of genetics in routine OBGYN practice. I would like to thank uh, the OBGY societies uh, from Nashik, Jargao, Malegao, and my place Dhure for, uh, for a good participation, for providing uh, uh, such a good uh, 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 amount of participants, for providing the uh, platform for, all of, uh, for uh, the geneticists to uh, speak their mind a platform where all the gynecologists can come together and have a good practical discussion. And uh, without taking any further time, let me introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Snehar Mallakmir, ma'am. She's a clinical geneticist. She's a consultant clinical geneticist with postgraduate training in pediatrics and fellowship in clinical genetics. She practices in Navi Mumbai at her clinic a clinic of genetic medicine in Nehrul. She's a clinical genetic advisor with Med Genome Labs and also consultant geneticist at Apollo Hospitals, Navi Mumbai. Since the last few years, she's consulting patients in genetic specialty from all faculties of medicine, from preconceptional, prenatal, pediatric, adult medicine to cancer genetics. She's invited as a speaker on topics related to clinical genetics at various clinical meetings, awards, posters, and case presentations at national and international meetings, as well as publications and book chapters related to genetics in various specialties. We are lucky to have you here, Dr. Snehal Mallak Nirman. Yeah, so good morning all, and uh, thank you, uh, Aradhana, for in, uh, this kind introduction. The uh, whole uh, the three session package is, is intended to uh, just uh, run through uh, an overall as aspect of applications of OBGY, the clinical genetics in OBGY, because uh, many of you uh, must be hearing about genetics throughout uh, last uh, meetings, and because uh, the uh, tests are being done now uh, at a wider scale. But uh, still, uh, some uh, aspects of uh, clinical applications uh, which need to be uh, the which uh, generally as practitioners we need to be aware is still not happening. And uh, the pace of genetic investigations and discoveries and therapeutics is so rapid that there should be a catch on. Uh, and then uh, I just thought that we should fill this gap up. So uh, I will have an overview of clinical genetic applications in OBGY. And first uh, and foremost thing we should remember uh, variations versus abnormalities, because as we are dipping uh, down into genetics, into investigations, we should not be uh, mingling variations and abnormalities together. There are because uh, we, it, is a, it is like a colorful population where um, not any color is abnormal. So there is a boundary line where variations can go into abnormalities, there is a threat to life or there is a uh, life quality is uh, compromised. So we should be able to distinguish that. And that is where genetics helps us. Uh, it's not about just OBGY applying genetics for uh, deciding termination of pregnancy or not. It's not about MTPs. It's about realizing which variation we can call it as abnormality and we can help out couples or patients to deal with those abnormalities. So choice is left with patients, couples who are coming to us 
to know about it. So that is a very important thing because uh, as I, I will discuss few of the cases, there are few very mild or there are very few boundary lines which we as uh, doctors and clinicians should must understand. And uh, there should be a discussion with the laboratories, with the specialists, with the radiologists, with the geneticists to decide what is to be done in such cases also. Because everybody now has started, you know, I mean, Down syndrome and chromosomal aneuploidies and severe abnormalities, everybody knows of. Everybody is able to detect with high resolutions uh, the severe abnormalities. So what's that, what's there in uh, lies in genetics uh, about it? So that is how the point is where we should start understanding it. So if I if we when obstetricians you know apply so and so is applied to fetal medicine, there are always a boundary lines like there is a fat facial profile, there is a mild cleft palate, a mild cleft lip because we are using 4Ds. There may be few of the common uh, or very uh, subtle abnormalities like choroid plexus cyst. Whether it is abnormal, whether baby is abnormal or not, choroid plexus cyst may be an abnormality. But whether at that point of time, at that point of gestation, whether it is associated with genetic abnormality. So there is a subtle line where we should start realizing these abnormalities and we should be able to correlate these abnormalities with genetic mutations. So this is a striking example and a very, uh, very start of when, when the genetics all, almost started off as a clinical application. If you, you can see uh, a gene which was discovered, SHH, that is Sonic uh, Hedgehog gene, and it is implicated in holoprosencephaly. cephaly. Now these mutations cause holoprosencephaly cephaly as an um, as an autosomal dominant uh, abnormality. So if you can see the spectrum of abnormalities it causes, right from very severe at left up and uh, holoprosencephaly, brainy abnormalities. And down, if you see, there are completely normal individuals because autosomal dominant presence as variable expression. And some of the patients can just be carriers. They need not have abnormalities. So where this abnormality starts, so this is a classic, I mean, we this paper is 1999. So we have realized so early that some genetic mutations may not be abnormalities, but still clinical applications are lagging. And this, this uh, name was uh, given because there was a character hedgehog with horny spikes and the gene causes abnormalities in research in fruit fly embryo where there is a spiky embryo. And this led to this name. So this is this figure itself explains that we should be able to differentiate severe abnormalities, milder abnormalities versus normal uh, variations in the population. And this went on to, uh, this This application was, uh, is being applied now. This is a 2009 paper where they started deciding about left-right asymmetry, like we are getting patients with situs inversus. We are detecting an abnormality situs inversus on an radiology. So primary ciliary dyskinesia is one condition which causes situs inversus, but some of the situs inversus individuals are completely normal. And some of them, in spite of being autosomal recessive, some of them, they might cause such a severe problem, respiratory problem in the baby that the baby is very severe respiratory disease in an NCU. So this is, this, this started under, so genetics has helped us in making an, a clearer understanding that what is causing the heterotaxy or what is causing left-right asymmetry in the body. So not only about abnormalities, but it is evolving science, which is helping us to define pathways, how this left-right asymmetry in the fetus is uh, decided. So that is in a way helping us to understand our own um, anatomy and biochemistry in detail. And this is like, you know, genetic blueprint of kidney development. So all these things in genetics have helped us in understanding about more about embryology. So when it comes to genetic causes and inheritance, we all know Mendelian causes, single gene defects, autosomal dominant, recessive, X-linked. And now because we have so many uh, deeper insights into genetics, we all know that there is there are non-Mendelian causes, there are mitochondrial inheritance, which is mostly dependent on mother because mitochondria come from mother, germline mosaicism, multifactorial and complex inheritance. So apart from Mendelian causes, there are so many other causes in genetic mutations, which we need to, uh, which we need to understand. And there is a epigenetics, which is is coming up rapidly in a multifactorial diseases. So apart from autosomal dominant recessive and X-link, there is a whole list of um, mechanisms by which genetics causes abnormalities. 
Uh, just to take an example of birth defects in cardiology, if there are fetal, uh, fetus having ASD or VASD or complex congenital abnormalities, on the left side, if you can see, it is uh, it, it depends on either chromosomal imbalance or copy, copy number variants. Copy number variants meaning copies of the chromosomal dose abnormal in mother's father, mother, father versus their babies. So copy number variants can be just variants or they can be abnormalities. Then there are single gene defects, then there are multifactorial and teratogen. So this is how it comes where whether this defect, congenital heart defect, is caused by chromosomal imbalance, that is chromosomal anuclide, whether it is just a copy number variant which is not associated with any other abnormality and which can be corrected after birth, no associated mental retardation or other systemic abnormality, whether there is single gene defect causing some any syndrome or any problems, whether there are any, any other systemic manifestations, it's just multifactorial. So you just can't decide about doing, you know, just doing genetic investigations, you just can't decide whether it is a genetic abnormality and few percent teratogenic that, we, that you all no fetal alcohol syndromes and all. So this is where we should make the clear, uh, if you if we can make the clear boundary lines and explain it to the patient that why this abnormality has happened in you and then offer them the further choices. Because understanding uh, origin of the uh, life is, has been constant pursuit of man, understanding origin of disease has been pursuit of man also. And right from a historical era till now, we are under, in, a, in a way genetics is helping us in understanding origin of disease so that in medicine or in a surgery, we can help them to get a precise therapeutic options. And in mental inheritance, everybody knows that there is how he performed the um, experiments to come to a conclusion, what is autosomal recessive x link and autosomal dominant inheritance when it started off. And now where are we standing? Now where are we standing? We are standing where uh, tissue, we, we started off with organ uh, problems and uh, we started discovering problems in organs in science. Then we went on to tissue, deeper tissue level. Then when we on, went on to well, what are the protein abnormalities like you are doing HCG, you are doing PAPA. So these are proteins in uh, maternal serum screening. So we went on to protein serums, I mean serum screening where we are detecting proteins. And now we are going to gene level, which is producing this protein. So when we started off in MBBS, we started off this histopathology, we started off seeing, you know, electron microscopy, whether mitochondrial abnormal, whether cytoskeleton is abnormal, where lysosomes are abnormal. Now we are actually going into deeper levels. What is causing this lysosomal storage disease? It's not just, you know, lysosomal abnormal histopathology. What is causing infertility in this patient, male patient, where centriolar abnormalities because of genetic abnormalities? Mitochondrial abnormalities leading are implicated now nowadays in many of the diseases. Cytoskeletal abnormalities are implicated in all your diseases of fetuses where there is uh, joint problems, where there are um, bony problems. Then uh, cell membrane disorders, muscular dystrophies, uh, channelopathies. So we are target, targetingly knowing what is the defect line behind this pathology. And this is a quick overview of uh, human genome organization that we have 46 chromosomes, 22 pairs of autosomes, and 20,000 20, genes approximately, in which when you are applying sequencing, we can do single gene sequencing, we can do exome sequencing, where we are doing chunk of these 20,000 genes, and whole genome sequencing, meaning sequencing all these 20,000 genes. So this KB and MB is uh, BP is base pair, one base pair that is adenine and guanine is one base pair. If there are 1,000 base pairs, it is one kilo base. And if there are 1,000 kilo bases, it's one mega basis, mega basis. So this is how these terminologies are read in the report so that you can understand whether there is one base pair deletion 500 KB deletion or 1 KB or 5 KB deletion or duplication or one mega base deletion. So that is how you can just interpret the genetic reports. And this is the organization of DNA into chromosome. So this DNA is organized into a chromosome. So when we are looking at a karyotype, like looking at chromosomes, but when you are doing microarrays, we have to extract the DNA and we are doing, we are still looking at chromosomes at deeper levels but we are extracting the DNA. So sample collection is in different bulbs. And when we are really looking into DNA, adenine, guanine, cytosine, we are extracting the DNA, but going into the molecular levels of sequencing. So these are various investigations, which have, you must have heard in previous meetings that we are quite karyotype and fish, everybody knows. Left-hand side up is karyotype fish. You are using up in fetal medicine to get quick reports. 
Then third figure up is um, MLP, which is being done for big deletions and duplications like induction muscular dystrophy. Down the left is microarrays, which are used which are used for micro deletions, micro duplications, and actually, American Society of um, Obstetrics is now uh, recommending that uh, fetal medicine should start applying first year test microarray as a first year test along with a karyotype or without karyotype because to provide us a detailed reports and last is sequencing where we are really looking at whether there is adenine guanine cytosine abnormality so this is just an overview how the investigations are being applied so earlier we used to use i mean now also we use karyotype to define a bigger problem in the uh, in the chromosomal abnormality so if there is a definable phenotype like down syndrome or turner syndrome or cryo chart syndrome we directly go and do a karyotype but if there is no definable syndrome whether we we know that this may be a chromosomal abnormality or multi systemic abnormalities or if there is just an intellectual disability then we go on to do not a karyotype but a microarray because that in that in that case karyotype is going to come normal so before applying these uh, investigations we should ourselves first apply our hypes and fears about genetics first is hypes because um, as as everybody hears of genetics um, uh, in the news about genetics in other areas of plants and animals and uh, research and science there are some hypes like genetics versus non genetic whether every, everybody everything is based on genetics no there is a genetic and environment correlation and epigenetic factors where it cannot be may not be non genetic so every abnormality or congenital abnormality or where we are not getting answers so just labeling everything is genetics will be a hype then if there there every everything you know there are gene therapies available stem cell therapies available so if we can't if we can't advise um, every patient that uh, it it is applicable it, it is applicable we have to really decide whether that is available as per the current age to that patient and then they can further go on to decide about their pregnancies then cord blood banking whether it is helpful and in what context the cord blood banking will be helpful to that patient whether they should be they should be paying for it or not because there are options available for cord blood banking to be stored at free and alternative therapies because genetics uh, people may think that there is no therapy at all and it is going to be mental retardation so just take an alternative therapies and spend money over it over the counter testing just go and look at our mutations whether we are comes the prediction of cancers whether we are prone to this or that it's not going to help and fears so uh, uh, once we address this hype there are also fears in the minds of clinicians because it is difficult to understand a genetic disease because of its complications as we knew as we have seen that there are variations in the manifestations of many of the genetic disorders so genetic diagnosis we feel it is complicated because of various types various inheritances and before telling it to the patient we should address our fears through such platforms where we discuss cases genetic diagnosis is always you know associated with mental retardation not true collection of samples was earlier tedious now if you can if you be, you know um, uh, like now today we are with med genome laboratories any from anywhere the sample pickup has is very easy now you can just have a you know word word of uh, with the contact and the sample can be picked up transport is not very difficult earlier you be used to uh, just just 6 7 years back we used to have that packing and all it's not necessary and then temperature maintain everything is taken care by the laboratory then convincing patient about possibility for the genetic disease whether you know the whether patient will go off from me once once i tell them that this can be genetic no once you have a dialogue with the patient that what are the problems associated with this and what is the possibility of genetics in your own problem if you are confident there is no problem in convincing the patient about possibility of the genetic disease and labeling the patient that before labeling the patient any anything that this syndrome or that syndrome or that abnormality we should be able to uh, see and analyze the problem apply the investigations and then only we should label the patient we just can't write on the paper that this is this and this is that syndrome unless we have a definitive clue or definitive diagnosis in the form of investigations and in the clinics now where to begin whether it is genetic we have to take targeted family history three generation pedigree to understand the inheritance or if there is any family history so any these are just the initial clues uh, which everybody knows that there is there are multiple affected family members 
multiple abortions with negative routine investigations and you are stuck whether it is where to go now whether there is the disease is severe but there are unknown factors or you know uh, there are no risk factors which you can point on and now you, you want to explore genetics there are severe malformations intellectual disability which cannot be explained positive screen and non-invasive investigations like ultrasound are positive. There is sex predilection that only males are affected and you're suspecting X-linked and of course infertility. So these are the problems where do immediately you can just think of genetics. And there are other things where you are stuck at the disease, then you can start exploring genetics. So now with this all background, we should really go and start doing this right away in our office practice without any fears, because we are here to address two of the laboratory. We are, there, is a, there is a bunch of clinicians which you can help their phone away. Uh, there is a rapid and immediate sample pickup right at your table at your clinic or hospitals. They, we are here to help you. The reports also before you address patients that to exp how to explain this report, what is there in that report, and what is to be done with this report now. You know, once that report is there, what where to go next? So we are here to help you. So right away, I think that this is a time that we should start doing it. And start doing meaning right from understanding pedigree. So if you can see in this figure, the arrow shows the mother who has come to your clinic and anything one step above, one step sideways, one step up is first degree. Anything down to do two steps down, two steps up is second degree and three, three steps up, three steps down is third degree. So this is just a quick idea you can also draw or even if you don't draw in your busy practice, it's just to go away and uh, understand if there are any family members associated because as you go away, the genetic sharing go, becomes less, very less, less, less. And as you come closer, the genetic sharing is more. And that is how you can just quickly make out whether there is a genetic pattern of inheritance. And samples for genetic analysis, just to list out, and you know all, but still, uh, peripheral blood lymphocytes. So in a karyotype, you take blood in heparin tube, just two to three ml sufficient for uh, extracting DNA, blood in EDTA tube. You one can take fibroblasts from skin. I have enlisted these tissues because we get IUDs, we get stillbirths, we have uh, a, suddenly a patient comes uh, to a fetal medicine or a sonologist and tells on uh, sees uh, very severe malformations and calls up the obstetrician gynecologist that this is not survivable. Then. Of course, immediately you can take the fetal sample because anyway, patient is going to terminate their pregnancy. So you patient did not visit twice. You can just collect the sample, store it, and then call the patient and discuss with them whether investigation need to be done. So there are many scenarios where the uh, poor uh, dialogue between radiologist and the obstetrician and the laboratory will help. So these tissues we, we can take, take off or IUDs for abortus, for POCs, for uh, stillbirths, or any neonatal death happening in your nursery at uh, obstetrics in, immediately after delivery. So skin fibroblast, amniotic fluid cells, that is prenatal diagnosis. You can take any tissue, liver, muscle, bones. Laboratory will immediately help you how to collect it and say, uh, keep it in the fridge. Umbilical cord, if baby is, you know, there is very severely malformed or there is uh, the baby, you cannot just take the tissue from the baby because uh, it has been uh, two, three, uh, two, three days inside the uterus after I would just take a cord to a sample, just take the fetal end of the placenta and blastomere in pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So just we can see quickly few uh, few cases in this uh, pregnancy where we, we, because everybody knows now and everybody can search. If you can see this type of abnormalities, you can quickly search on internet that what is a diagnosis. But there are few things which we still need to do uh, a discussion uh, as to how to apply it into clinical practice. So this is the arrow shows the pregnancy for which the couple has come. So mother is 27 year old um, uh, in the, uh, this current uh, gestation and a very, very, uh, uh, I mean, large entity, 5.9. So from seeing this scan, you know that this is a hydrox pregnancy. So now if you can start telling them uh, that uh, there is a risk of chromosomal abnorm abnormalities, at this gestation, you may terminate this pregnancy if there is a severe hydrox. Sometimes these hydrox pregnancies with such severity can come into bits and pieces and very at a, at a very early stage where you are just not able to take tissue, just comes into bits and pieces and not able to collect. So what to do? 
So here you can take help of some, in some cases during this ultrasound, you can take CVS sample and take out the DNA or whatever investigations you want to do. Or if it is, you can see that you can collect the tissue, call into, uh, you, you call the patient to a nursing home, terminate and then collect the sample. What if the Fenty just borderline increase? That is a common scenario where the problem comes where what to be done, what is to be done after you do this dual and triple markers or quadruple markers, what if the NT is borderline increased because you have already sent the sample and keratotype comes normal. Now what next? NT is borderline increased. There may be there is one single abortion in this case and one baby is normal absolutely. So what are you going to do in this pregnancy if NT is borderline increased? You have done markers, which is normal. You have done a karyotype because you got the risk uh, for 13, 18, 21 high. So there are many other uh, abnormalities, some syndromes like Noonan syndrome, some of the microdeletion syndromes, some of the systemic abnormalities which are associated with high NT. So what we usually tell it to the patient that if you are doing CVA, so if you are doing amniocentesis, just store the DNA so that if karyotype comes normal, we still have, we don't have to do the procedure again. And depending on the anomaly scan or progress of the pregnancy or the patient choices, we can do further investigations on the sample. And there is a chance without applying dual and quadruple markers, NIPS, that is non-invasive pregnancy testing, which Dr. Priya is built talk on that it is very at a very less cost now quick results so you need not do all these things you just apply nips see for because now nips can be done right from one to all chromosomes we are not only doing for 13 18 21 now at the very less cost we are screening all the chromosomes in nips so you just take nips for uh, uh, borderline cases quickly have a view of all chromosomes. If it is normal, then you can have an invasive procedure if there are still doubts for genetics. So this is how just the pregnancy of an hydrox can be. I have just taken an example of hydrox so that I can elucidate the problems associated with it. You know, norm borderline NT increased to a very high NT. Right away, you can see hydrox on, uh, hydrox on the uh, ultrasound. Taking it further, if same hydrox come to mid and late pregnancy, we had this case. Now the arrow shows the female baby born and have taken this case so that we can retrospectively start thinking what we have done in OBGY. What happens is the patients who are having difficult pregnancies, abnormalities, IUDs, stillbirths, they sometimes tend to change the hospital, tend to change the obstetrician and gynecologist. So previous obstetrician and gynecologists are really in dark what has happened to my patient and we are not able to understand or learn from that case. So take this example, this couple is second degree consanguinity and I've told you that this helps South Indian family because second degree consanguinous marriage is quite common in South India and even in Maharashtra. Previous bad obstetric history, second pregnancy, male hydrops, stillbirth. Third pregnancy, female hydrops, stillbirth. So definitely not extinct. And fourth pregnancy was MTP because there was early signs of hydrops. And the fifth baby, which was, I mean, fifth pregnancy, which was uh, in during the pregnancy, the baby had anemia at 20 weeks of gestation. There was history of hydrops and earlier scans were showing with no no other systemic abnormalities, only hand drops, no congenital heart disease, nothing. So the couple wanted to carry on this pregnancy if there are good chances of survival. The baby was given intrauterine blood transfusion and the baby was delivered in uh, at eight months of gestation prematurely and received in NICU with respiratory distress. Without going into details, I'll just say that hereditary spherocytosis was suspected in this baby and we got the mutation of hereditary spherocytosis. The point here is, these babies of this previous pregnancy might have, there might have been some suspicion of high drops in early pregnancy. They were not followed up after that. No in genetic investigations were offered in third and fourth pregnancy. No detection or sample collection or storage was done. And that is why, you know, uh, the once this baby came to a tertiary care where fetal uh, medicine people gave intrauterine blood transfusion and the pregnancy could go till eight or nine months and baby could be delivered. The currently baby is uh, on blood transfusion, but otherwise normal, even developmentally normal. So this is how you have to dissect each case what is the cause of high drops in that particular pregnancy and without genetic investigations we are really in dark what is the real cause and it is i have said in the initial slide that it's not just about mtps and terminating pregnancies 
because there is a huge uh, phenotypical spectrum associated with genetic disease. This is an example of Gaucher disease. So at one severe end of type 2, you will see hydroxypetalis. So even in some of the lysosomal storage disease, you get hydroxypetals. And if you don't know that this is a cause of uh, this hydrops, then a new baby, next baby can be born as Gaucher disease. Some of the Gaucher disease type 1 babies are completely treatable now with enzyme replacement therapy. So we have to really understand a disease in the context of genetics rather than only focusing on uh, how we are going to do it in uh, pregnancies. Few perinatal examples. This is the child uh, born with, uh, uh, shown by arrow, second of the twins, five-year-old girl born of IVF, second of the twins, and presented to a genetic clinic uh, for short stretcher and some speech delay. The few family members which have depicted uh, in the uh, generation, third generation, they had short stretcher. Now this baby is born of IVF. D is a uh, first, the mother had died and there was second marriage. So that is how, that is why this pedigree shown like this. So this, now here we understand that some of the family members are having this uh, at an late age showing short, uh, short stretches. So it can be autosomal dominant. Some of the family members having disease manifestations late and this baby has come at five years uh, of age. So now this, whether this was detected in pregnancy, this baby's sonologist had shown some of the signs that there can be query uh, late onset, I mean, late detection of short bones in the pregnancy. If you see at before 20 weeks, you know, you just say that baby, there is, there may be skeletal dysplasia, the short bones, severity and patient may terminate. But this baby scans after 24, 28 weeks, it was an IV pregnancy, precious pregnancy, difficult to decide, you know, difficult to give option again for termination. So this uh, sonologist had seen and if you, there are fetal medicine specialists in the meeting, so there are subtle problems where you have to take help of these measurements of diaphyseal, metaphyseal angle, better than expected BPD. So sometimes you are difficult to decide whether it is borderline short bones, so borderline short long bones, and whether here we can apply genetic investigations because this is this baby is completely mentally normal the short stretcher is can be managed the bony camp complications is not managed so it's not about termination it's about explaining picking up the disease early after monitoring in the pregnancy there was some suspicion of maybe this query query short long bones should have been followed up in the uh, uh, post neonatal age group and should have been diagnosed. This is the pregnancy where the couple had G2P2 D1 lettuce to one death within 10 days of life. First baby was born, was detected on antenatal scan. If you can see, postnatal UHG brain showed some heterotopia. So some suspicion of CNS disease on antenatal and postnatal UHG brain, and the baby died of all these complications within 10 days of life. And second baby, First baby, no definitive diagnosis was done, but because there is a cord blood storage done in many of the families in view of you know these advertisements, cord blood storage of the first baby was done. Second baby, during the pregnancy, there were doubts over cerebral hypoplasia during sonographies. But this baby also uh, died when we uh, saw this paired couple and uh, we, we took the photographs, but once they went back without, before investigation, the baby died. So we had, and the, they, they, in the first visit, they were not, uh, they were doubtful about genetic investigation, but we still had cord blood storage of the cord blood sample of the first baby stored with the uh, laboratory. So here comes uh, of the discussion between normal variants, the query, query cerebellar hypoplasia, few choral plexuses going extending into 24, 28 weeks of pregnancy and all these abnormalities which sonologists see, they are, you know, they are just discussing whether to do neurosonogram or fetal MRI. So here we did, uh, we took those, that cord blood sample and investigated and there was a detection of pontocerebral hypoplasia type 12. And now we, the patient you have seen in the earlier said that both the pregnancies were LSAs. Now you go on to do LSC uh, and again, next pregnancy and abortion was difficult for the uh, couple. So PGD can be applied pre-implantation genetic diagnosis because couple were carrier for the mutations. So here comes the role of neurosonology, fetal MRI in early pregnancies, correlation of that abnormality with the sonolo sonol sonographies 
and the clinical picture and arriving at a diagnosis because sometimes even laboratory is stuck if the clinical features and correlation is not given and we just give query query reports of variants of unknown significance because complete workup is not done and in that case you also if you discuss pgd in the first instance paper patient did not go on to the all trauma again of the third pregnancy and third cesarean section which is difficult for the gynecologist gynecologists and obstetricians are stuck on their own obstetric problems when it comes to such difficult and precious pregnancy and this is the uh, this is the case where a couple presented at uh, 18 weeks anomaly scan Uh, no significant family history, just one abortion before, and first trimester screening was normal. Wife was HBSG positive. Uh, NT scan was normal at eighteen weeks. Again, there are short long bones. Query, query, CTV, uh, and no cardiac focus, etc. No other systemic abnormalities. Two D echo was done because there were some abnormalities. So let us see if there is any other systemic. Everything was normal and mild short long bones now in view of that the couple wanted to terminate the pregnancy and this prenatal counseling was already done that why this short long bones there are multiple causes of short long bones and query short long bones like at 18 weeks you, you are seeing that there is a possibility of skeletal dysplasia but you are not exactly getting clues on your ages whether it to label it as skeletal dysplasia or it will be just a soft stretcher so this dialogue was done with the patient that there can be perinatal lethal problems non lethal problems some of the abnormalities can present later if you wish to continue you can just look at chromosomal abnormalities and if there is no severe abnormality patient can continue if they want to discontinue still you have to a store it saved the sample so patient terminated the pregnancy and after pregnancy after the uh, termination we did a uh, we did a x-ray which was showing two fractures and the baby was diagnosed on genetics uh, genetic investigations as osteogenesis imperfecta now osteogenesis imperfecta is a condition with where there are multiple uh, types some of them are very mild can be managed with medical management pediatric orthopedicians and are well for life some are very severe so there are types which can only be decided on a genetic testing now and now because since last 10 15 years we are having this genetic diagnosis some of the couple i mean some of the parents even if they are affected they are carriers they are going they are going further to have pregnancy so like this female 23 year old case with congenital hyperplasia managed excellently well on glucocorticoid replacement therapy genitoplasty was done twice uh, and they were seeking a pregnancy now because it is autosomal recessive we know that the baby can be at most carriers if father is not carrier but here again there are problems with, for the obstetrician gynecologist to decide on the fertility because overall fertility rate, rates are less in such patients and nowadays i think most of the if you see infertility cases we are finding genetic causes we are finding hormonal causes related to genetics but because we may not we are not investigating we are not going into and details we are missing on to it so some many of the infertility or po uh, pcods can have this genetic problems actually underlying so overall infertility is reported in this patients and there are problems with gender assignment psychosexual behavior i'm not talking about cah per se but i'm talking about generally uh, problems genetic problems associated with uh, gender uh, assignment psychosexual behaviors and we need to monitor this patients this females this uh, for weight bone density and metabolic problems as in during pregnancy around pregnancy after pregnancy so if forget about prenatal diagnosis it's, it's also about management of such patients who may be carriers or like in this case affected but excellently managed on medical management and just a case of male infertility where three abortions uh some of iu i tried ivf tried and then where a uh, wife karyotype was done which was normal husband karyotype shared just one cell with 714 translocation now how to decide whether this one cell with 714 translocation is really related to infertility and abortions or not because if there is mild or not and when the patient had uh, husband had teratozoospermia so nowadays we are doing sperm fish to see if sperm abnormalities in chromosome 13 18 21 but whether we should be applying microarrays in this cases to go on to decide the extent of abnormalities 
cause of infertility, whether they can go ahead with PGD or whether we have to give them option of adoption or something like this. So this, 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 this is uh, important because now patients themselves want to know whether they can have their own baby, whether they have to adopt, whether they have to have home, home donation or sperm do donation, because it's not very easy to advise them just to have sperm and ovum donation or adoption because they, they it itself has psychosexual uh, implications. Uh, newborn screening just for OBGY because most of the, not even in the, the big hospitals or tertiary care hospitals, even nursing homes are now taking up screening for congenital hypothyroidism. And I urge it is very simple. It is very cheap. It is and it is effective to detect these problems earlier and to prevent mental retardation. So please screen for primary uh, congenital hypothyroidism, uh, congenital adrenal hypoplasia, and thalassemias. Because these disorders, if there is a single instance of the uh, baby having thalassemia and treated early, can have excellent uh, prognosis. Uh, thyroid can be managed, congenital adrenal hypoplasia can be managed. The uh, disorders which I have listed down, if metabolic problems detected earlier can be managed. So at least at your nursing home or hospital levels or your practice levels, you can just de decide which patients can take up only hypothyroid or CA screening, which you can apply hemoglobin disorders also, and which patients of high risk or other patients, you can give them option of newborn screening from blood spot right away for all the, right away at, your, at the delivery, discuss with them and apply this because the therapies are available. Management is available if it is done earlier. Just a few words on breast ovarian cancer because it is available. See this family of the arrow shows the person who, has, who is consulting at 60 years of age. Now her uh, father has died of some cancer, mother has died of very unknown cause. Uh, we know that uh, breast cancer, ovarian cancer and prostate cancer can be in the same family. And her daughter has also died at early age of CA ovary and now they're consulting whether she is having, you know, the, she has been detected at late and the daughter had earlier uh, manifestations because of CA ovary. So, and one sister. So when you see now the patients are asking because we can give them option of early screening, early treatments and excellent medical management depending on the cancers. I have taken breast ovarian cancers, but there are many cancers nowadays depending on the genetic mutation can be managed well immunotherapy is being advised. Sometimes it is blanketly advised without doing genetic mutations, but we should be able to do it because once we lose that patient, we really lose what is the family mutations. And if you know the family mutation, it really helps in screening the family members. And this is important because unlike previous scenarios, we have medical treatments, we have metabolic disease management, we have bone marrow, liver, kidney transplant at Apollo hospitals. Uh, Navi Mumbai with the genetic department, we are taking specialties together where we can see which patients can be treated early, who can be provided bone marrow, liver, kidney transplants, because even financial assistance is now available and patient did not have to pay all together for transplants and managing complications are there. And all these three figures showing you that there are some therapies like gene therapies are available. There are some therapies like stem cell therapies are coming in and actually available for hematological diseases and cancers are available. Other diseases are still in research, but clinical trials are coming up where you can apply this gene therapy where you can apply these uh, treatments based on genetic mutations to so some of the patients like thalassemia, sickle cell, and induction muscular dystrophy. So in view of the growing therapeutic options, uh, Wilson disease, which is, can be excellently managed. Uh, and if there are any complications, we can have liver transplant. So there are growing therapeutic options, which can be discussed. And some of the families are really taking it up that they don't want to terminate the baby if therapeutic options is available. So this is how uh, this is how we have to um, before we write uh, any investigation discuss we should know the limitations of the testing limitations of our uh, diagnostic uh, evaluation implications of this uh, in this, uh, if, if, of these uh, genetic disorders complications of the disease and complications of the investigations applied and the treatments applied and once we uh, balance this out in the office practice and if we offer to the patient uh, then they have the choice to take the options of whether they want to treat this disease 
they want to have a prevention option, which reproductive option they want to consider like IVF, like PGD, or like going on to natural conception in the next pregnancy if prenatal diagnosis is available, or if nothing is available, then whether they want to cut a chance or they would want to take a chance of adoption. So there are so many options, which, but option taking with understanding is, what is desired with genetic testing. It's just not about, you know, because doctor decides and doctors wants to tell them that this is severe or genetic disease, just a minute, no. It is about making ourselves understand and making others understand the nature of the genetic problem they can have and then choose the option. So it is about empower, empowering us also and empowering the community also about deciding options. So th that is why in summary, I did not list uh, uh, what, what can be take home most messages. The take home here today's uh, uh, scene is we have to come together as an obstetrician, pediatrician, parents, family, social network I have listed because you increasing social networks is really helping patients to join together and explore options. Uh, have some pressures on deciding authorities to make these options available or to give financial assistance. We have a laboratory, med genome laboratory now uh, catering to all spectrum, I mean, whole spectrum of obstetrics. Earlier, uh, but there were only specific genetic uh, diagnoses are available. Now they are offering maternal serum screening, NIPS, so right from your problem, preconceptional testing, carrier screening, which Dr. Meenakshi will talk about. So it's right about preconceptional, prenatal, maternal serum screening, and diagnosis of the babies, newborn screening. So it's just about coming together and discussing our problem. So even if we are not able to cover everything about this, understand everything about this is not possible. Let us somebody, you know, give, take brush, let us something, some give advice, let Somebody can paint, somebody can advise, somebody can really complete the picture. So there are different, different uh, roles of for each of these in just single pregnancy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Snehal. Yeah, uh, next, would you like to... Yeah, next we... Yeah, I think Dr. Aradhna will take up questions later. So we can go on to have uh, our next uh, topic of uh, non-invasive prenatal uh, diagnosis. And for this, we have Dr. Priya, uh, who is heading reproductive medicine at uh, Medgenome uh, Laboratories. And uh, she is catering to all the tests related to pre-implantation genetic diagnosis also, prenatal diagnosis, NIPT, and uh, NIPT in singleton and uh, twin pregnancy. And over a few years of Medgenome experience, she really, if you can display CV slide, uh, Abhijit. Yeah, and uh, right from uh, inception to developing this NIPT and all, she has been involved in this uh, reproductive medicine at Medgenome. Uh, she has been. Uh, she she is. She had masters from uh, National University of Singapore, and she has been. Uh, she has been also overlooking uh, this program of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is a very important nowadays with uh, couples carrier screening also. So we can have her uh, talk today. I think uh, because of some emergency, first she is not able to come, but she will. She has sent her recording of the talk, uh, and she can take up questions later. I think during live, if she can join us. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Snehal, for organizing this webinar uh, on current applications of genetics in routine OBGYN practice. And also, uh, thank you to the organizers, uh, Foxy, Nasik, Jalga, uh, Foxy, as well as uh, gynecologists and obstetricians of Dole Society. Uh, I'm Dr. Priya Kadam, and uh, I will be speaking about non-invasive pre- prenatal testing and pre-implantation genetic testing during the So as such, reproductive genomics uh, does involve a lot of tests to help you uh, take care of your patients. So non-invasive prenatal testing is one of them. Um, there is also carrier screening to look for abnormalities in the couple uh, in case they have, I mean, there are certain indications to do carrier screening testing. Uh, today, of course, I will be focusing on NIPT as well as pre-implantation genetic testing. So what is non-invasive prenatal testing? Non-invasive prenatal testing is uh, looking for cell-free DNA and testing the cell-free DNA of a pregnant woman for chromosomal abnormalities such as 21, 13, 18, X and Y, 
and uh, certain times triploidy, microdeletion syndromes, rare autosomal aneuploidies, and also other conditions like RHD status. You can also look at certain monogenic disorders, and there have been further advances in this. Uh, why it is called safe and non-invasive is because it just takes a blood sample from the mother uh, for knowing the abnormalities in the fetus. So now it is known for many years that there is genetic material which comes uh, from the mother, I mean from the fetus to the mother. So that could be in the form of a fetal cell, it could be in the form of DNA, it could be in the form of RNA. So uh, there had been enough research going on for fetal cells uh, for this testing, but uh, it is the uh, DNA, the selfie DNA, which actually took off and led to this testing. So now there are certain factors about cell-free DNA which we should all remember. It was of course discovered in 1997. The reason we should understand this is because it has implications uh, for the diagnosis. And uh, remember that the cell-free DNA is present in all individuals, pregnant, non non-pregnant male female it is present in all individuals but when a woman is pregnant uh, the selfie dna from the fetus or specifically from the placenta actually comes out and circulates in the maternal blood and uh, its comp its fraction uh, that is the amount of fetal dna in the maternal blood is called the fetal fraction and this is about 5 to 25 percent of the total self DNA and uh, uh, more importantly it clears rapidly after the baby is delivered. So using this self DNA uh, many laboratories actually so when this test uh, was discovered and became commercially available in 2011 uh, since it was a new test, uh, several international societies came up with their own guidelines. Maybe I think the earliest came around 2013 or 2014, in which they recommended that this test be uh, offered to high-risk pregnant women. But later on, as the performance of the test was uh, noticed and uh, the clinicians understood the test even more as well as uh, a larger uh, groups of uh, individuals, it was found, uh, it was recommended that this test also be offered to all pregnant women. Of course, uh, as obstetricians, all of you know that uh, routine screening for chromosomal abnormalities is important and has to be offered in some form or the other uh, to all pregnant women. Of course, there have been previous tests start or e even uh, risk factors beginning from age of the mother. So non-invasive prenatal test is one of the most sensitive tests for a common chromosomal aneuploidies. And as such, the tests which are uh, commonly offered for screening of these chromosomal abnormalities are maternal serum screening and NIPT. How they compare is shown on this uh, slide. Of course, uh, non, uh, the advantages of non-invasive prenatal screening is that from nine, nine weeks onwards, you can test throughout. Actually, uh, I do get requests uh, to test after, say, 24 weeks. So as such, technically, the test can be performed. Um, the only difficult part probably is counseling if the patient turns high risk uh, for the abnormality and then is subsequently confirmed. So technically, this test actually can be performed throughout uh, pregnancy from about 9 to 10 weeks of gestation. Uh, the most significant feature of this is a very low false positive rate and now more and more conditions can be uh, found out using the non-invasive prenatal test. But having said this, of course, it doesn't uh, replace the prenatal ultrasound. Now, ultrasound is extremely important even for NIPT because we need to know um, whether it's a singleton pregnancy, whether it is, uh, whether there is any other abnormality which is being seen. So this is useful. And um, of course, uh, the, uh, these are the screening tests, the maternal serum screening and NIPT. The, uh, the invasive tests, of course, would be chorionic, uh, chorionic villus sampling and amniocentesis. And the tests which are performed, which will be diagnostic tests on this uh, fetal material would be FISH, 
or a QF PCR or karyotype or a chromosomal microarray or sometimes when you're looking for a specific disorder it could be a Sanger sequencing or exome sequencing to identify certain specific disorders. Now uh, where, uh, we have been doing this test for over six to seven years and uh, in our experience we have found uh, the common clinical indications for which uh, the clinicians send a sample is if it is high or intermediate risk on maternal serum screening. The other indication is advanced maternal age. Sometimes there can be some uh, ultrasound abnormalities, sometimes a family history of an, abnormal, uh, of an abnormality. And in some cases, there may be a no clinical indications actually written on the TRF. Of course, it, it might have been missed. Now, with our experience of doing over 40,000 samples, uh, what we have seen with the current uh, technology which we use, that uh, in over 98% of individu individuals, you will get a call. In about 2.4% of the individuals, there may be a no call. And the reasons for this, I will be discussing later. And uh, of these 98% uh, of individuals who get a call when you send an NIPT sample, about 95 of those will be low risk. And about 2.5% would be high risk. So when it is high risk, uh, it has to be tested by invasive testing because there is a chance, though a very small chance, that it is there could be a false positive. And in case there is a redraw which is requested, there are certain pre-analytical and post-analytical factors. The pre-analytical factors will include low fetal fraction or, I'm sorry, lice sample or low sample volume. And uh, the post-analytical factors are usually low fetal fraction or a QC failure. Now, uh, with our experience, of course, as expected, the most common abnormality that we have seen is trisomy 21, followed by 18 and 13. Sex chromosome abnormalities actually form about 20% of all uh, cases. already went through that and then uh, see the impact of NIPT has been felt worldwide why is it such a popular test is because it has led to the reduction of uh, invasive testing throughout the world the impact is most seen in this slide uh, in 2011 when the test became available there has been a steady rise of um, adoption of the test and there has been a reduction in the in uh, the number of invasive procedures and of course it is available all across the world. Now, what are the major advantages? I will go into the details a little bit in the next few slides because you have to compare it with the existing test that you will have. One is the high detection rate. So the detection rate is over 99% for trisomy 21, 13, 18. It has a lower false positive rate as compared to the serum screening. And uh, so there is a big difference there. And also it, it causes a reduction in the number of invasive procedures uh, during uh, the testing. And also the high negative predictive value helps avoid invasive procedures again. Now, a negative predictive value is is also is when it is a low risk uh, result it is highly li unlikely that the fetus is affected so mostly if there is no other indication the patient can rest assured that it is fine and of course in case of risk assessment is independent of age now what is the difference between uh, nipt and uh, and the common uh, traditional methods of screening, especially first trimester screening which is shown in this slide. So you would see that a sensitivity of standard screening is about 78% while self-free DNA is for all patients about 100%. And what is more important is looking at the positive predictive value. So positive predictive value is what is the likelihood that that are given a positive result that the fetus is truly affected. This is where a major difference is seen. So for standard screening, it is 3.4% and for self-free DNA uh, screening, it is 80.9%. Similarly, for trisomy 18 and trisomy 13 also, you see a major difference in the positive predictive value, which is about 14 with standard screening and 90 and 3.4 and 50 over here. So uh, that's why, I mean, this is one of the main reasons why NIPT performs much better than the standard 
screening. So there was this case uh, in 2017 or even in your experience, you might have come across a case where everything on the scan was normal, where uh, the double marker or maybe in this case, it was a triple screening, which was normal, but the baby was born with Downs. So when you have a highly sensitive test, um, I mean, we should just be aware that this a very sensitive test is available, which can be offered the patients now as such we have performed a study on um, how well this uh, test performs in india with about 10 centers and uh, we have also noticed a sensitivity and specificity of over 99 percent for trisomy 21 13 and 18 there have been certain false positives and some of the reasons for false positives are something which i will explain a little on in my slides and this is another publication of our work where we were able to detect a turner syndrome which was actually a isochromosome i won't go into the details now let's look at the typical scenarios in which nipt is used the like we said also in clinical indications the most common would be high risk on combined screening as you can see here uh, though it was high risk here nipt is low risk and a fetal fraction is given here so in this case usually if there is the ultrasound is clean uh, the uh, patients could uh, the clinicians recommend continuing with the pregnancy so the follow-up in this case uh, was genetic counseling. The diamond yield scan was normal, uneventful pregnancy, which resulted in a full-term normal delivery. So uh, the fetal fraction is very important for non-invasive prenatal testing because uh, uh, the laboratories will have different cutoffs where they report the fetal fraction. So it can range anywhere for, from 2 to 4%. And uh, it is generally believed that a higher fetal fraction actually gives you more confidence in the result. And it's always important to remember that low fetal fraction may be associated with certain aneuploidies. And all the guidelines recommend that fetal fraction be reported in all cases the most uh, the most well-known association of fetal fraction of course is with maternal weight so we know that as the maternal bmi actually goes on increasing the fetal fraction uh, will be uh, lower so uh, but this should not actually uh, discourage you from offering nipt to uh, obese and overweight women uh, because uh, we have seen that they do get good result. Maybe just a little bit of pre-test counseling telling them that if there is a possibility that fetal fraction can be low and that we may need a, a redraw uh, in your case uh, is quite helpful. Other, the other major association of, of fetal fraction is with gestational age. So as gestational age increases, there will be an increase in fetal fraction. There are a few other factors which affect a fetal fraction. Uh, we mentioned two others could be a fetal aneuploidy, which is also mentioned. There could be triploidy, there could be multiple pregnancy. In multiple pregnancy, total fetal fraction increases, but the fetal fraction decreases per fetus. There are certain maternal factors also which influence fetal fraction, which mean uh, the main one is ma uh, maternal weight, maternal autoimmune diseases, if they are taking a low molecular weight heparin and a few other conditions also result in a reduction in fetal fraction. The other typical situation or the outcome of an NIPT test can be a high risk result. Take for example this case, a 39 year old but her risk on combined screening was only 1 in 7 to 9 but it turned out to be high risk for trisomy 21. Now every high risk result has to be confirmed by invasive testing. So this patient was counseled and uh, they went in for invasive testing and the fish as well as the karyotype confirmed that it was trisomy 21. So after counseling, they went in for termination. Now, this is a typical uh, case. Uh, in addition to this, we are also asked questions about some specific uh, conditions or some of the new applications of NIPT. So let us go into twins. Now, uh, we know that twins are about 3% of the cases and it is difficult uh, to do the regular screening for these as well. And also, twins may be associated with higher complications. So, uh, uh, now what, how, where does NIPT stand with respect to twins? Now, the latest meta-analysis has actually shown that uh, it performs just as well in twin pregnancy 
than as it does in singleton. So for trisomy 21, 13, and 18, the sensitivity is uh, pretty high. For 21, it is the maximum, and for trisomy 13, it will be low. And uh, there are certain recommendations from uh, sev uh, several boards. In the earlier uh, guidelines, there wasn't much information on whether NIPT is recommended in twins. But uh, with the meta-analysis in 2019 and or 2020, ISPD has come up with a recommendation that it can be offered for twins. Uh, this is the ISPD position statement that it is it shows high detection rate and low false positive rate and a high uh, predictive value. Now, should NIPT be offered for rare autosomal trisomies? Now, the the, uh, the jury is still on about this because they may not have that much clinical significance. But as more and more data is coming in, uh, there is a little more evidence on how whether it is useful in rare autosomal aneuploidies. So what are rare autosomal aneuploidies? Those are monosomies or trisomies in chromosomes other than 13, 18, 21 and sex chromosomes. We know that they usually miscarry if they are there early in pregnancy, but they will have certain clinical implications as we will see in the next slide. Uh, so the incidence as such is about 0.35% uh, uh, of all pregnancies. And the most common rare autosomal aneuploidy is trisomy 7, uh, followed by trisomy 22 and trisomy 16. So though, uh, though they may not have that much clinical significance, uh, some of the recent studies have actually shown that in 50% of the cases, when you find a rare autosomal aneuploidy on NIPT, 50% will result in normal live births, but other 50% may have some complication, uh, such as miscarriage, there could be an intrauterine growth restriction, or even postnatal growth restriction. There may be a UPD uh, of the chromosomes, uh, which are amenable to UPD. There could be malformations, which may be detected later on, or it could even cause sudden uh, intrauterine fetal demise. And also, sometimes there could be a true fetal mosaic. And in many times, uh, rare autosomal aneuploidies are actually confined to the placenta. So now, uh, let us get on to what are the limitations of uh, NIPT and what we should be aware of. So there is a possibility of about 0.3% of the cases where you might have a false positive. That means the NIPT is positive, but uh, when you do an invasive testing, the fetus is normal. Such scenarios have been encountered by us as well, and there are certain biological reasons that this could happen. Most importantly would be a confined placental mosaicism in which the uh, abnormal cells are confined to the placenta. There could be a maternal mosaicism in which the mother actually has abnormal cells. We should remember that cell DNA actually has a maternal component as well. And uh, sometimes it can be an algorithm specific. And vanishing twin is one of the major causes for a false positive result because probably the vanishing twin was abnormal. Then there are certain false, sometimes there could be a false negative result. This again could be because the fetus could be truly mosaic. There may be uh, not enough fetal fraction to have made a call. And in certain cases, uh, like I showed earliest our data, we have about or less than about 2% or less than 2% of the cases where there is a no call and a redraw is requested. And the reason is because of insufficient amount of uh, uh, fetal DNA. Sometimes uh, repeatedly you may get low fetal fraction and uh, these are some of the reasons. And sometimes NIPT can result in finding uh, the most uh, unusual or uh, uh, abnormal results. And that is because there could be a detection of maternal neoplasia or uh, these are some of the unintended findings. So what is the cause or the mechanism in which the false positives and false negatives occur? So if you look at this diagram, uh, this is how uh, uh, 
fetus or a zygote is formed which then starts dividing and you see these are all euploid cells and suddenly there is a trisomic cell there. So now this trisomic cell may again uh, divide and survive and based on how these cells differentiate and form the trophectoderm as well as the inner cell mass, there could be a, a change, uh, they, uh, I mean, it will have an impact on how, how it will react with NIPT. As you can see here, here both the plas placenta and the fetus is normal. So this will be a normal NIPT and fetus also will be normal when it is born. In this case, there is mosaicism. There are two different types of cells and uh, the fetus may be, uh, will have an abnormality, but it will be mosaic. It will also be seen on an NIPT. And when you do... Um, but in this case, it will be a false positive. That means the placenta is abnormal, but the fetus is normal. In this case, the placenta is fully abnormal, but the fetus is normal. So these two are cases of false positive. But here, it, it's the inner cell mass in which there is an abnormality which has propagated and resulted in the fetus. So this will actually give a false negative result. The other question which we frequently get is, uh, can we do NIPT in vanishing twins? So let's get to that. We had a case actually in which uh, there was a 37 year old woman who had a history of vanishing twin at six weeks. NIPT at 17 weeks actually showed the presence of a vanishing twin. Uh, so as such, uh, we do not recommend vanishing twin for NIPT, but um, uh, many times it may be a precious pregnancy. So people always ask how long does the DNA from the vanished twin survive in the fetus? So when you look at uh, uh, this particular study by Kurt now uh, it it has shown the presence of the fetal DNA from the demise twin up to uh, eight weeks after fetal demise so if there is no choice that you have to do an NIPT or an invasive test is not possible uh, you would want to wait as long as possible from the fetal demise to the time the sample is sent so our experiences will have to be extremely careful. In about 0.2% of the NIPT cases, you would find a vanishing twin. That would result in false positive in some of the cases. Uh, as such, guidelines discourage using uh, uh, NIPT to look for um, aneuploidies in vanished twins. And um, most of the uh, MPSS methods uh, do not will not be able to distinguish whether the DNA from the vanished twin is still present or not. And it cannot be processed as a twin sample either. So the summary for the NIPT part, it's a very sensitive and specific test for assessment of common chromosomal abnormalities. The greatest advantage of this is that it reduces the need for amniocentesis and its associated risk. It has a high negative predictive value, which, is, which gives reassurance to the parents. And um, the, we still don't know uh, whether, I mean, as such it is, we don't know for sure. The jury is still out for expanded screening and for micro deletions. And both pre and post test counseling are extremely important because uh, this is a genetic test, which needs uh, some amount of pre-test as well as post-test counseling, and it can be carefully integrated into prenatal screening. So we'll go on to the other section, pre-implantation genetic testing, or PGTA, PGTM, and PGTSR. So what is pre-implantation genetic testing? That is uh, testing of the embryo before uh, implantation into the uterus. So now uh, this, for convenience, it is divided into three uh, sections. So these, uh, during IVF, actually, how do you select the best embryos for transfer? Now, uh, the earliest methods was morphology. And uh, uh, by morphology, they would try to identify by certain factors of uh, whether there is uh, I mean, uh, certain factors or methods of grading. And with that, they would uh, select the best, grade the embryos and transfer them. Now, the when the it was graded and transferred this way, the success rate of uh, pregnancy was about 41%. Uh, so now, uh, as more and more uh, techniques became available, uh, it was a stu this study actually conducted uh, on uh, MDOs showed 
if there is a if the embryo is graded a b or c by morphology uh, what is the percentage of euploid and what is the percentage of aneuploid embryos so you see that even with grade a embryos only about 68 percent of those are euploid and about uh, 32 percent of those would be aneuploid so therefore just based on morphology it is hard to uh, distinguish what would be a euploid embryo which would then have a better rate of implantation less rate of miscarriage and a uh, better chance of live birth now what would the earliest methods for assessing embryos uh, have been fish uh, fish actually had the limitation as that it could only look for certain chromosomes and not all this was followed by qPCR and then the array CTH and then NGS. NGS now actually has the maximum resolution. So why should PGS be done? So it is uh, some of the studies have shown that PGTA or PGS actually improves implantation success rate with a study in 2016 and it mainly allows single embryo transfer. So with single embryo transfer, it will result in um, less complications and less rate of miscarriage. Okay, and a single embryo transfer also results in five times lower miscarriage rate in women over 35 years of age. Now, what are the common clinical indications where PGTA is offered? So, PGTA is offered in women with uh, advanced maternal age when there is a recurrent implantation failure. There is a, uh, several miscarriages, severe male factor infertility, when there is a prior pregnancy with chromosomal abnormality and also when uh, people undergo pre-implantation genetic testing for monogenic disorders. Now, uh, this, this graph here actually shows uh, the number of euploid embryos as the age of the mother increases. So, you see that at 44 years of age, only 20 or 15 percent of the embryos would be euploid and therefore, a pregnancy at a later age and uh, which is which is not uh, successful naturally IVF with a PGTA might be recommended now let's go to what is pre-implantation genetic testing for monogenic disorders so uh, for mono disorders uh, this is the algorithm uh, we have developed as such because this is for couples who already have an individual who is uh, who, who is affected, a child who is affected, or there may be a family history of uh, genetic diseases, or they may also be, uh, they might have done carrier screening where both the couple seem to have an abnormality, a common abnormality. In such cases, the embryos can actually be screened and we can identify embryos which do not have that abnormality and therefore recommend them for transfer. But remember, every time a PGTM is done, it is also greatly recommended that PGTS, uh, uh, PGS or uh, PGTA be also done in each of these embryos because depending on the age of the mother, it may be likely, it is likely that uh, some of the embryos can be aneuploid. And therefore, when PGTM is done, both PGTA and PGTM should be done. So, um, I'll give you a typical scenario. These are the typical scenarios in which pre-implantation testing for aneuploid is done. This is how uh, the report will look. You would look at uh, individual samples, uh, embryo ID is 1, 2, 3, 4. And if the aneuploidy is detected, it is reported. This is the summary which is given. And then if there is no aneuploidy detected, then the embryo can be used for recommended for transfer. But if an aneuploidy is detected, that is a full aneuploidy is detected, then the embryo will not be recommended for transfer. And if an, an, uh, and there is one other condition which we will see later. So this is, uh, this is how a typical plot will look for an euploid embryo. You see that at two, um, this means there are there, there is copy numbers are two throughout the chromosome. So this will be an euploid embryo, which has a good chance of success uh, or it is it will be the first preference for transfer. And an aneuploid embryo would look like this. Uh, so you see here that there is only one copy of chromosome 22. So there is a loss of chromosome 22 here. So full chromosomal aneuploidies are not recommended for transfer.
there is another pattern uh, that we see sometimes and that is called a mosaic embryo as you can see here in chromosome 12 you see that uh, there is a loss but it is not it does not indicate that it's just one copy so these uh, type of embryos are called mosaics so what should you do earlier uh, as such uh, there were no guidelines for this and we were not recommending them for transfer but now there is more and more data which uh, which uh, which have resulted in a live normal births in some of these cases and um, there are some guidelines which have developed which kind of uh, give a idea on how to choose the embryos for transfer in these cases so what is mosaicism right uh, so uh, as you can see here there are three different embryos the first one is fully euploid the second one here is uh, aneuploid so it is fully aneuploid the the trophectoderm as well as the inner cell mass is aneuploid and uh, in this mosaic in this case this is a mosaic embryo where you have certain cells which are aneuploid and certain cells which are euploid so when a trophectoderm biopsy is taken it depends on which portion is sampled so if this portion is sampled then you might have uh, depending on the number of euploid and number of aneuploid cells that will decide the degree of mosaicism now should the mosaic embryos be transferred or not uh, there have been certain guidelines by pgdis and cogen which recommend uh, what are the issues with the transfer and as such they don't say that it, it should not be transferred but uh, how to select the embryos for transfer and this is only done uh, when uh, there is no other embryo available, no euploid embryo available or uh, the couple may not be going for any further cycles. So uh, in this, um, I mean, there have been certain studies which actually have uh, have divided embryos into two types, especially the mosaic embryos into those with low level mosaicism and those with high level mosaicism. So when you compare the transfers with low and high level mosaicism, you see that the miscarriage rate with um, high level mosaics is pretty high compared to the uh, two low level mosaics and ongoing pregnancy rate did not show any significant difference so there are more and more studies which are coming in and uh, uh, dr francesca gratti has actually recommended how to classify the embryos based on where the aneuploidy is so if uh, uh, where which particular chromosome is involved in the aneuploidy and based on that you can uh, give the priority for transfer because each of these would have different consequences so if uh, if it is if it is an aneuploidy or a mosaic which you see in chromosome 13 18 uh, 21 and um, sex chromosomes it is better not to transfer because these are viable pregnancies and then uh, the others um, are given over here so this there is a detail uh, detail uh, chart on how to prioritize this embryo now this this was about pre-implantation genetic screening now let's go into pre-implantation genetic diagnosis so diagnosis is when uh, when there is a specific abnormality which is present so i will just explain this by going over one case which we have done we do get a lot of inquiries for this because uh, it is it is especially families who have an uh, who has a child who have been affected by a serious disorder and then uh, then they want to have another child free of this disorder so they may or may not have evaluated that child and uh, based on all the information uh, we do a complete workup and uh, try to uh, screen the embryos for this disorder so this particular case uh, was yeah, so this was a couple who had a child who was three years old who was seen by a clinical geneticist in a, uh, in a hospital in Bangalore. And uh, the clinical indications were neonatal seizures, microcephaly, bilateral low set years, and uh, there was a 
uh, they, they had some ECG findings as well. So uh, the uh, clinician actually evaluated the child by a clinical exome in which it was found that uh, he was carrying an X-linked recessive disorder, though it was uh, uh, given as unknown, uncertain significance back in 2017. Uh, the, the child uh, uh, had partial agencies of carpal callosum, Massa syndrome and hydrocephalus. Now, this is a X-linked recessive disorder. Now, uh, where once it's X-linked recessive disorder, we need to check in the parents whether the parents have um, are carriers of it or has it developed de novo. So the parents were evaluated by carrier screening and by carrier screening, we found that, of course, the mother was the carrier of the disorder. Then uh, when we, uh, the couple karyotype was also done and uh, which was entirely normal. And uh, the lady meanwhile conceived again and a prenatal diagnosis could be offered to this uh, pregnancy. Unfortunately, the fetus was affected and then they decided to terminate that pregnancy. So uh, this, uh, this couple was keen uh, to have another child because meanwhile, their first child had also expired and succumbed to the condition. So um, they approached uh, another uh, IVF center for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis who then approached us. We evaluated this entire uh, history and uh, since all the workup was been done, uh, by knowing the exact uh, variant that was present is very helpful uh, while doing a pre-implantation uh, genetic diagnosis. So uh, they sent uh, samples, uh, the, uh, the couple sample or the end affected child sample which we already had because uh, it was evaluated in our lab. There was this L1 cam mutation or a variant which was seen in this. And uh, in this, uh, this, uh, this was the report of the pre-PGD workup. So uh, many time you can consider uh, sending samples for pre-implantation genetic testing uh, for um, monogenic disorders. A certain amount of uh, pre-PGD workup is necessary. And uh, this, uh, as you can see, that it, it can vary from case to case. It can depend on the type of variant variant, it can depend on whether it is a deletion, duplication and also the method that we will use to help the couple can vary and therefore the pre-PGD uh, workup is most essential. So once a uh, pre-PGD said that yes, uh, we can go ahead with the embryo biopsies, the embryo biopsies were sent. There were about 11 embryos biopsies which were then evaluated. And by evaluating the embryo biopsy, uh, we uh, got two embryos which were trans which were uh, ready for transfer. So we give priority based on uh, whether they, it's completely free of the disorder or it could be a carrier. So based on that, uh, the priorities are given. And if it is affected uh, either by PGS or by, uh, by pre-implantation genetic testing by aneuploidy, that means if the embryos are aneuploid, they will not be uh, recommended. So it should not, it should be euploid and it should not have that variant. Okay, so that would be the best embryo for transfer. Luckily, this lady had two embryos like that. And uh, uh, this this was the initial picture which you saw of uh, Dr. Rashmi, the two lady, uh, two babies. So this was the case where it was, um, uh, they had a very good outcome after having uh, two affected uh, children. So what is new in uh, pre-implantation genetic testing? Non-invasive PGT. So just like non-invasive uh, NIPT for uh, aneuploidies, there is also NIPGT. So now there are two methods by which this is done. And uh, the recommendations for mosaic embryo transfers are also new and that I have gone through uh, in the previous few slides. And also uh, the ART Bill 2021. Now, uh, I'll go very quickly through this. Uh, this is uh, this is actually uh, when the embryos are cultured, there is a spent culture medium around it. So it is this medium which is used to test uh, for abnormalities of the uh, embryo. Now uh, this uh, this shows concordance with the trophectoderm biopsy, not as good as the trophectoderm, but the concordance is about seventy percent. The other method is the blastocentesis um, for uh, testing. And 
as you are all aware there is a new art bill which has come up which does have a section on pre-implantation genetic testing where it recommends pre-implantation genetic testing for monogenic disorders and uh, it also uh, recommends that uh, it is a technique which is used to uh, used for defects in the embryo which is created during in vitro fertilization so that's all from me thank you very much uh, thank you for this uh, video. We'll thank uh, Dr. Priya also for such a nice talk on an elaborate talk on pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, especially because it is rapidly coming up, being offered by many centers. And NIPT, there were many doubts. There are still doubts maybe there uh, in the minds of uh, clinicians because it is cheaper now and being apply applied to, as Dr. Priya said, healthy pregnancies. So we will also address these doubts during the session, after session and ongoing also, we want to provide a platform to physicians. Now, we should, uh, we should, if you can display the side of uh, CV, we welcome Minakshi. Dr. Minakshi is uh, DM Medical Genetics and uh, was earlier with uh, Sargangaram Hospital, now is associated with MedGenome as a consultant geneticist. She is, uh, her uh, postgraduate degree is in uh, OBGY, so she is better connected to OBGY problems and uh, understands how it is applied uh, in genetics. Uh, she is also uh, now currently working as clinical geneticist uh, with MedGenome uh, Bangalore. Uh, she has a specific interest in prenatal genetics and reproductive gen uh, genetics. But now today, I think she is going to speak on uh, screening, which is rapidly coming up in uh, India, right? So, uh, Meenakshi, welcome and you can start. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Snehal. So, I'll be sharing my screen. Uh, a very good afternoon, everyone. Hope I'm audible and the slide is all clear. Uh, so beginning with the preconceptional genetic counseling and in the era of NGS, uh, it is very important because, you know, uh, the uh, genetics has now become genomics. Genetic Genomics means like uh, uh, there are single tests by which we can cover the whole genome, all the chromosomes, all the single genes simultaneously. And the uh, very important thing is that the pricing has come down. It's become more cost effective, more affordable. So uh, the basic screening has uh, is going towards the exp expanded screening. But you know, in a country like India, the basic is also, we're not very good at the basic screening as well. So I'll be touching upon both the basic and the expanded carrier screening here. So the roadmap of the talk is going to be, so what is carrier screen actually? What is the take of ACOG on this? And uh, we'll start with the basic genetic disorders, which we must, must screen. Obviously, we all know about thalassemias, but there are others also which have a higher free carrier frequency, like spinal muscular atrophy, fragile X, DMD. Uh, and we'll be discussing all these on case-to-case -case basis. And secondly, we'll be uh, joining, uh, the second part would be the expanded carrier screen by the NGS, which is coming up uh, very rapidly. And it's very, very helpful in many a circumstances, which we'll also see again by case-to-case -case basis. So what is basically a carrier screen? What, what, uh, what is the definition of a carrier screen? So it's a type of a genetic testing that I will perform on healthy people who will display no symptoms of a genetic disorder. So on a healthy couple or more commonly on the wife. And uh, when I suspect that there is risk of some genetic disorder, that is, uh, they might pass on to their children based upon their ethnicity, based upon their family history, or just based upon you know, the general population carrier risk. And carrier screen we offer not for the autosomal dominant, but for the autosomal recessive, where the risk of reoccurrence is 25% and the X-linked conditions. Uh, so there was a committee opinion uh, from the ACOG society in 2017 and I would just give you the crux so they said that okay uh, because it was from the west they said cystic fibrosis must be tested obviously it was being tested for a lo uh, long period of time for our, our South Asian population it was always implemented that uh, thalassemia should be tested and but the new thing here was the incorporated SMA spinal muscular atrophy so that was incorporated during this time and uh, this is actually even a later statement now because the recent ACMG have come out, which we will be discussing in later on. But just to focus here on this slide is that, yes, the committees, the ACOG, which we really all uh, follow, is also, you know, uh, is not behind. They, they are also catching up to the screening and they also consider it to be a very pivotal part. Uh, 
So SMA is cystic fibrosis, hemoglobinopathy, especially for our part of the population, fragile X also. So uh, now uh, we are starting with the basic part. So for the basic carrier screening, uh, thalassemia we should never, never miss. The carrier rate for thalassemia is uh, around two to three per hundred for some populations in India. And for some, it might be as high as 10 to 15 per hundred. So a simple HPLC in husband and wife is very important. Uh, in either one of or both of them is very, very important because as of yet, it is a very disabilitating disease with uh, no, uh, uh, no definitive treatment. The BMT is there, but definitely it's a very difficult road ahead for the patient. The second is spinal muscular atrophy. And I know my OBGYN friends have not incorporated this yet into their practice, but please do consider it so. Spinal muscular atrophy, we will be discussing it, is also another debilitating disease and I'll show you by means of some slides, like it's gained quite a momentum in the social media. As Dr. Snehal pointed out, social media is really a connecting factor with the patients nowadays. Third is the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. There are different scenarios for it we'll be discussing and fragile X. So uh, just a representation of this case for thalassemia. So this family came to me visiting. So this was the lady who came to me. They were a doctor couple and they on either side of the family, see on the husband's side of the family as well as on the wife's side of the family, their history of a child being affected with thalassemia major. And they already have a child who's fine, but now they are concerned that the second child, uh, because actually they both were diagnosed after this baby was born. So now they are concerned, is this pregnancy at risk for thalassemia major or not? So their HPLC screening was done. And wife was HBD Iran carrier, A2 plus D Iran peak was 79.2, which is going towards the homozygous kind of a range. And HPLC, the husband was a pure beta thal carrier one. So uh, obviously, we need molecular testing here, and molecular testing was done. So, husband was a heterozygous uh, 51 del C carrier. Wife was a compound HET, probably, which was uh, deciphered later on. She had two mutations 51 del C and a 67 G2C, that is HBD Iran. And the child, they also tested the previous child, they were anxious about it. The child has the same phenotype as the father, see, because must have got this from her and this from the father. Now, her parents were tested and one of them was this a normal thalassemia carrier and her mother was the HBT Iran. So this lady actually was not a simple carrier. She was actually B beta, B, uh, as we call it. She was a D beta and he was a beta thal carrier. So here some complexities do arise and we went ahead, there was a 25% risk and unfortunately the fetus had this from the father and again this from the mother. So it was a homozygous affected baby and they had to terminate the pregnancy. Right. So just uh, the mutations in the other family members. So now this really helped us. The HBB gene analysis really helped us here because the husband, though he was a carrier, the wife was HBD beta, the son was D beta, who would be normal. But, you know, the fetus was still at risk of a homozygous beta thalassemia. So these different, what I want to uh, point out here is that the different thalassemia mutations are there. There is HBD Iran in the area there that I practice. I see a lot of HBD Punjab here. I see HBQ India. I see uh, HBD Merit. I, I, sorry, HB Merit, HBD Iran. There are so many variants of hem, uh, hemoglobin. Sometimes, you know, the interactions are very important. Like uh, the wife is HBD uh, Iran. The husband is uh, HBQ. What is going to happen? So these are sometimes they are innocuous, but we uh, really need to uh, dive into these cases for some time. So uh, just see the demographics. Why is it important to screen them? The total number of patients for thalassemia in India is more than one lakh. The annual new births for thalassemia is still 10,000. This is too much. Like we have such good screening for it. Why is it still 10,000? The carrier rate is very, very high. We cannot eliminate the carriers, but we can put in place a good screening method. And more so over in the Southern uh, India, uh, uh, Southern, I would say the Western India, I think your population also has a lot of this uh, carrier rates. And the higher carrier rates are in the Sindhis and the Punjabis from Northern India, the population that I cater to. Some from the pockets of Gujarat in Maharashtra. Maharashtra also has a large number of sickle cell patients that I know of and uh, in some belts in Karnataka. But this is so simple and no 
thalassemia, no woman should walk through antenatal clinic without having a thalassemia screen, period. That's for sure. So, uh, and interactions are very, very important. So we learn by this case that it is a very common uh, uh, disease, which we should not miss time and again. And I know we are not missing, but still. And um, uh, secondly, there are interactions. There is not simple HBB always. There are variants of thalassemias, which have different interactions that need to be looked at. And I have not touched upon HBA1A2 gene here, which is common in the Eastern population of our country. Uh, the six states, uh, sorry, the seven sisters. So they, they, that is common in those uh, populations. That, uh, that has a different testing te technique to go by. So, uh, so if an Eastern patient comes to you, you have to think about that. HBE, pop, HBE uh, variant is common in the Kolkata region, in the West Bengal region. So uh, uh, the ethnicity also becomes a very important point here. And the screening modalities, we all know, HPLC and not, not only HPLC, I see so many times HPLC reports only, always please incorporate the RBC and the indices along with it, MCV, MCH, RBC count, hemoglobin, that is also very good, uh, important, it should be part and parcel of our, this uh, testing. And the spouse testing is required if it is uh, if one of them is a carrier, uh, if the wife is a carrier, and the interactions as again and again I'm emphasizing. And you know when you get a positive HPLC report, that is your chance to counsel the entire family. If the wife is positive, her sisters, her brothers also need to be tested. So that should be imparted in record form as well as in a um, uh, in, as a gesture that please get uh, your family tested as well. Because uh, it's so disheartening, still the uh, uh, female is tested, she's a carrier, and still she has uh, births uh, uh, with thalassemia in her family when she was already a known carrier. Maybe this um, knowledge was not disseminated by the patient itself or maybe the clinician. So uh, now coming on to the second part, the spinal muscular atrophy. This uh, was the disease that I said has been mandated by the ACOG and the ACMG to be included in carrier testing. So for us Indians, after thalassemia, we should slowly and slowly incorporate this into our daily practice to te test uh, one of the couple for SMA as well, because here the cognition is absolutely normal. So the muscles are not working. The child usually presents with motor developmental delay. The cognition is absolutely perfect. And the prevalence is one in 10,000 births which is not less and the carrier frequency there was a recent publication from my alma mater and this says that the carrier frequency is around 1 in 38 to 1 in 44 in northern India which is not less so less than 1 in 100 carrier uh, dis, uh, disorders uh, the, uh, who have a carrier frequency of less than 1 in 100 should be screened and it has a higher carrier frequency of around 1 in 38 and the major thing is there is no uh, cure for it so just by putting up these pictures, I want to share that maybe you have seen these posts coming up on Facebook for crowdfunding and uh, uh, for the, because uh, recently gene therapy has come for this, but you know, uh, that could be effective only uh, when these children are identified early. And it's, it's exorbitant. The prices are so high. Most of us cannot afford it. So uh, it is always better if we can prevent it in some way. So it is it being a recessive disorder, the risk of reoccurrence is 25%. The treatment is very, very costly. And so it's always better that we uh, prevent it. And the case that I share here is uh, obviously uh, not a primary diagnosis. Um, I have started putting in, uh, I have started recommending uh, SMA's carrier screen for my patients, but uh, that is also a distant uh, uh, dream. Most of the patients don't get it done. So uh, first we clinicians need to be, uh, you know, uh, understanding that it's important. Then I think the patients are going to understand. So this patient came to me, she was 35 years of age and she had a normal child uh, who died at one year. Uh, normal in the way the cognition was normal, but the, the, there was hypotonia, there was no neck control, there was looseness of body. And now she's pregnant at eight weeks. So because the history was typically suggestive of SMA, 
and it is the commonest disorder. The carrier frequency is very high. So we tested uh, straight away first uh, for SMA and a homozygous deletion in the SMN1 genes, the exon 7 was detected and it is detect if the screening method is MLPA. Uh, that uh, the another thing that I will just gently like to put in here is it's not a hundred percent effective method. So because ninety percent it will detect it, but there are certain keep uh, it will it will not. So if you have a uh, suspicion that this is something looking like SMA, please refer to a geneticist because it might uh, MLP might not only pick it up. There are point mutations. There are something called two alleles on one. Uh, uh, sorry, two copies on one allele uh, kind of a phenomena, de novo mutations. But for general purposes, uh, the test is SM, uh, MLPA. It's not a routine blood test. It is a genetic test for SMN1 gene analysis. And this is how the report looked. Both of the husband and the wife came out to be carriers. So the SMN1 gene, there was only one copy. So one copy was absent. And unfortunately, uh, the previous child had uh, the uh, abnormal copy, he did not receive the SMN1 normal gene from the parents. So in this pregnancy also, we did a CVS for this couple and the fetus was again, a, was a carrier and carriers are going to be normal like the parents. They continue the pregnancy and a healthy birth was ensured. So the learning point from this is that the screening points could help us in the prenatal diagnosis here. Uh, there are different techniques that I said, MLPA is one, SMN sequencing is the other one. And we should, you know, take baby steps in this direction. We should really start offering it during our preconceptional counseling or the first antenatal visits. And I've started it uh, in my infertility patients, those who are going for IVF, because, you know, they are really amenable to the counseling part uh, because of the higher carrier rate in our population. And because the therapy is very, very limited and very costly and beyond the reach of the common man. And yes, ACOG does recommend it in its 2020 guidelines to be incorporated for every pre-pregnant and antenatal women, irrespective of the ethnicity, be it a Caucasian or an Indian woman. So the third disorder that I'm going to talk about is fragile X. Fragile, the odd disorders that we talked about uh, earlier, thalassemia, uh, SMA, these are uh, autosomal disorders, but fragile X is X, is X linked. Uh, typically, the boys are affected. Uh, fragile X is a common cause of uh, mental retardation, intellectual disability in the males, and it causes it around two to three percent of all intellectual disability cases. Around twenty-five to thirty percent of all X-linked mental handicap in the day, uh, 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 males. So, where do you have? families where you have you know typically males are affected or uh, the mama is affected and the uh, the sons are affected so in those kind of families it's very important and uh, one the incidence is as high in one in four thousand men and one in eight thousand women so sometimes these carrier women are also one third of them are also mildly affected and the carrier estimated frequency in india is about one in 150 to one in 200 but for the carrier estimation in india we are really not at a very good place because we have not had those widespread population-based studies that we can you know accurately predict what is our actual carrier rate. So it is a triplet repeat disorder. So the test here is entirely different. Is It is a TPPCR or a southern blood, but most commonly TPPCR is done nowadays. And very less, it's a sequencing uh, error or it's a point mutation also, but typically a TPPCR is going to detect it. So a normal alleles are up to 44 and greater than uh, 200 are full mutation. Uh, I'm not going to touch into the details, but it's just a small point that I would like to highlight is there between the normal alleles and between the full mu uh, mutation, there is something called an intermediate region, which leads to much confusion. And uh, uh, for those women, it is very important to get uh, counseling and their, uh, you know, be, uh, babies tested because uh, these uh, small repeats progress to the larger repeats and then the affected babies. The pre-mutation alleles are something to be taken care of. So just uh, simply uh, elucidating it with the example, uh, 
uh, one thing very important though children who are identified uh, with autism we do test fragile x in those children as well because it is a uh, differential and many uh, times it is seen uh, in people suffering with autism the child uh, the boy suffering with the autism actually has a fragile x disease so this woman came to me when she had a previous child with autism so the concern was is my next baby going to suffer with autism or not that was the concern and on uh, history she said yes uh, there is intellectual disability in my brother also so again two men connected with this woman so i would think of x linked disease uh, so but the brother could not be examined and uh, so we tested the son and there were more 100 pp pcr for fmr1 gene was done it was in the repeat re range more than 200 repeats and then we tested the mother the mother uh, uh, the mother was a premutation carrier and then what happens uh, so there is a history of premature menopause in these women of premature ovarian fa failure in these women so that is why it ma makes it important in our gynae practice also so uh, males with premutation have a tremor and ataxia. So uh, uh, the, her reproductive risks are going to be that she could have another son affected similarly because it's X-linked, but for her also there are risks because she is premutation herself. She could, you know, she, she can have uh, a premature ovarian insufficiency. They could pre present to you with infertility kind of a problem. Uh, these women could be, you know, a mildly simple kind of women you know, with mild intellectual disability kind of a problem. And obviously their children are at effect. So we need to give them prenatal diagnosis. PGTM can be provided an extended family screen. So when you identify one person to be a carrier in the family, do not stop there. Please mention in your records and just subtly tell the patient also, please spread a word in your family. So those, I know there are prejudices, but those who are willing, please come forward and get them test tested so that you know this is not repeated in the family at least so the learning points from this case are the carrier frequency for this disorder is also high it's one in 150 a simple tppcr test can detect it it's not too costly and we should be counseling such patient uh the acog said okay don't do it routinely like thalassemia and sma mlk don't do it routinely but there are certain situations where acog says you should do it like if there is a history of intellectual disability in the family, like there's autism in the family. If you have a patient uh, when, where there is unexplained ovarian insufficiency or failure, premature menopause, she's heading towards elevated FSH. And you know something in, in your infertility patients where you are giving stimulation and they are not responding so well. So there, these are the conditions where you should test them for this fragile testing. Uh, the fourth disease is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I'm pretty sure you must come across a family with this disease. The prevalence is quite, quite high, one in 3,500 boys. And it is actually a progressive disease. The cognition here is, again, the, uh, the, the mental uh, status is normal, but uh, the, uh, first the legs and then the entire body, the muscles fail you, and the child stops walking, becomes wheelchair bound, and eventually the lungs give way because of the respiratory failure or a cardiomyopathy. Treatment is available sort of uh, not a gene-based uh, therapy uh, as SMA is very effective. But the second is the uh, there are certain uh, uh, exon skipping treatments, but they are exorbitantly cost effective and usually not in place for everybody. It is again an X-linked disorder like uh, fragile X. Two thirds of it are familial and one third are sporadic. It is caused due to mutation in dystrophin gene. Again, it is due to deletion. So here the test is going to be different, right? So uh, our genetic test, simply we cannot, you know, there is not one test for everybody. So depending upon what the underlying disease mechanism is it. So it is a different test for everybody. Uh, yeah. 
so uh, just explaining this with the help of a case so this woman came to me her brother has expired with some muscular weakness wheelchair bound at 16 years and you know if the woman is coming to me now and the child the baby the brother expired long back definitely there would be no genetic testing no records available but then you think by the uh, by the history that they gave and by the you know general population frequency you think okay the first thing i'm going to test is test her for the dmd one so uh, dmd was done and she came out to be a carrier uh, and because she is a carrier there has to be a detailed post test counseling for her there are certain risks to herself and certain risk for her reproductive status so the risk of her uh, ex uh, passing on to the disease is 25% risk uh, for the uh, her to have affected sons so 50% of her sons and 50% of her daughters are going to be 50% daughters will be carriers and 50% of her sons are going to be affected so yes a prenatal diagnosis is required for her and uh, uh, as such she is not going to have any debility debility but around 8% of these women have some form of muscular weakness as they age especially more than 50 years and echocardiography should be done during pregnancy because sometimes they do have some heart um, or exertion or some form of uh, cardiac anomaly problem could occur in pregnancy so that should be kept in mind and for this woman we offered her a cvs we can also offer her a pgtm or a donor ova on case to case basis depending upon you um, uh, 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 discuss it with the family based upon the scenarios and again when i diagnose her i extend my screening and offer the screening to the other family as well for her other sisters as well so what happened was that the other sister was also a carrier and we, we and uh, uh, they also will have the reproductive implications to deal with so uh, from the Indian point of view, I would like to say that yes, always HPLC, CBC, RBC indices for thalassemia, SMN1 gene carrier analysis by MLP in the couple, they even test one of them first and uh, take a very good family history, ask about consanguinity, uh, extended in the family, just ask them, you know, the plain simple question, answer is always no. Is there any problem in your family? No. But you have to give them, you know, direct questions. Does anybody have a physical abnormality in your family? Does anybody have intellectual disability in your family when i mean your family i mean both sides of your families and you you will be many a time surprised that you will get answers which uh, initially you know yesterday only i had a patient she was carrying monochorionic twins and i asked her okay everything is good and finally you know uh, when we are deep down into the counseling she comes up my my brother has, you know, sensory neuring he hearing loss since childhood because uh, they don't consider it relevant. It is not their mistake. It is us for us to make uh, the relevance out of it, right? So there are certain uh, conditions which can be offered after counseling like Fragile X DMD. Uh, but uh, uh, more important is the second part that I'm going to discuss, the expanded carrier screen. So uh, the expanded carrier screen or uh, the ACMG actually want, uh, wants to remove the word expanded, but I've written expanded years just to you know encompass that it is including everything. It is not everything, it is including all the chromosomes, it is looking at the entire DNA. So this is a very interesting statement uh, made by Francis Collins, who was the former NIH director. He said that uh, it is it is uh, it is likely that within a few decades people will look back on our current circumstance with a sense of disbelief that we screened for so few conditions and that they will also be very puzzled and dismayed as i am now that our healthcare system put so many couples in an unnecessarily difficult position but by not identifying their carrier status until the pregnancy was already underway yeah uh, this could be a situation 10 years down the line when, uh, you know, uh, the things, the awareness is uh, more widespread and uh, the testing, I, I would still say it's, it's actually not so costly. It is already available. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, definitely, you know, you would have pe people coming on to you routinely, you would be seeing in your OPDs that, and if they come during the pregnancy, most of the time, that previous child is the intellectual, has dis intellectual disability, please take care of this pregnancy that this doesn't happen now. But 
uh, and then uh, how could you prevent this first child from having intellectual disability this could have been prevented only if the couple you know would have uh, undergone expanded carrier screen or because uh, there are many genetic disorders in uh, for which there would be no previous family history and uh, the ultrasounds prenatal and ultrasound would be, would be all normal so how would you identify such things or something would occur very late in the ultrasound like microcephalies you would see in the seventh or the eighth month of the pregnancies so for those first borns with genetic disorders the answer is expanded carrier screen so what is expanded carrier screen? So expanded carrier screen, EC is that I'm going to be uh, calling it now on. It tests for hundreds of mutations in one go, and it is not ethnicity based. Like, uh, no, uh, if I have a white woman in my OPD, I will not say cystic fibrosis. If I have a South Asian, I will not say thalassemia. It is, everyone has, gets the same treatment. And you know, it is very important also because now, now we are shifting towards mixed ethnicities. There are in so much of intercontinental travel, inter, interracial marriages and, you know, intercaste marriages. So the ethnicity is, is, is a fading trend. We are becoming pan-ethnic now and also this ECS does not uh, it is not based on your family history it's looking looking at everything without a bias and and what do we want to screen in ECS we want to screen for those autosomal recessive and X-linked conditions which manifest in children and neonates I am not targeting adult onset conditions right and which are associated with a poor mental status with physical and mental disability which are not treatable so i would want to prevent those diseases with this expanded carrier screen and why do we need it because you know uh, we are after down syndrome we are after the neural tube defects but when i talk of these diseases if i take them collectively the number of children with these diseases surpass the number of children with down syndrome and neural tube defects many times. So these diseases collectively are more common. So if we start targeting them uh, uh, and they are cost effective, you know, how, how much our healthcare burden could uh, be decreased. Uh, there are children with dis uh, genetic disorders uh, who uh, are just into the med healthcare system for the healthcare support. There is no treatment for them. So uh, we could, uh, it seems insensitive, but you know, we could have healthy children. Such uh, births could be avoided with the help of ECS. And it is most co more cost effective. And uh, it is especially important for those where there is consanguinity and inbreeding. And basically in India, we have a lot of inbreeding, if not consanguinity, though consanguinity is also there. And the ethnicity is diluting. Uh, I routinely see patients where the patient is from Punjab or Haryana and the wife is from the east or uh, the one is from north, one is from south. So the ethnicity part is diluting. Uh, and especially, you know, in a country like India, we do not have genetic data. I do not know, like the Americans have this data. They know that uh, there's these cystic fibrosis mutations are common in their population. They should test them first. So for India, because we have never had that uh, thorough level of uh, genetic testing in our population, I do not know which uh, 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 mutations are common in my country. So why not test all of them at one go? Because, uh, see, the SMA uh, carrier rate data paper came in 2019 or 20, when the West had its carrier rates since 20 years. So we are so far behind. So why not, if it is cost effective, to test everything? And advantages, it's not population based. Uh, because we don't have population data, genetic data, so it's very good for us. It's cost effective. And one very important thing that uh, I am routinely doing it for, uh, and the patients, uh, is when the previous child, you know, died of certain disorder and we have no records, which is usually the scenario. So we can test the couple here with this carrier screening, and I'm pretty sure mo many of you must be doing it as well. And uh, there are certain social stigmas also in our uh, families. Like I have patients uh, who want their screening. There is a history of some uh, genetic disorder in their family, but uh, they will not ask that child to be tested because uh, there is an issue that they might be offended. So they will say, we cannot test them, but you test us somehow. So that is also an implication that can be um, looked at this way. 
and what is the literature evidence so there was a very large study of around 24000 patients they took all the mixed ethnicities and at least 24% of them were carriers of at least one mutation and the overall risk for them for having an affected baby was around 1 in 280 which is much higher than that of having a downs or a neural tube defect baby which we already discussed you know and the costs as they are coming down so it's a very very good uh, statement if you counsel the patients the patients are aware and after a good pretest uh, counseling you offer them this and how is it going to change your decisions it's going to change our decisions because you know you will be able to offer them either cvs or amniocentesis which is usually my patients do opt for or they can go for pgtm i have a few patients with infertility who come to me and when i had a patient a couple uh, they were consanguineous and they wanted that uh, uh, they had a balanced translocation So uh, uh, just a few slides remaining. So the expanded carrier screening is discouraged for those disorders which are adulthood onset and which have a uh, variable penetrance and expressivity. And a pre-test and post-test genetic counseling is absolutely necessary because of the variance of uncertain significance and because the residual risk is never zero. And because it doesn't mean you don't need a detailed chromosomal analysis or uh, analysis screening or uh, an anomaly scans in your pregnancy so uh, this is just a pros and cons so it will decrease the uh, burden of genetic disorders and uh, it's it's the cost is less and it's more inclusive for everybody but the cons are it us you can get but definitely you have counselings we have geneticists uh, can address that a uh, bit of a higher cost still a residual cost and yes sometimes it leads to anxiety but a pre and a good post test counselling can address that issue so just a few case examples. First example where a previous child expired with clinical diagnosis, but no genetic testing. So it was a non-consanguineous couple came with a, uh, uh, a history of a previous child. They said died of Tay-Sachs disease, enzyme proven, no genetic diagnosis. What do they do? So what we did was we did a, uh, this testing and we found the carrier status of both the couple and then we could uh, offer CVS to them. The second example in which we used the ECS was a previous child expired with a vague phenotype and they had no clinical details and no records at all. And they were a non-consanguineous, a recent patient. So with, they said that there was some swelling at the back of the head of all the three children that expired. And we found a mutation in this listen carefully type 8 gene. So with no previous records. And now we can help this family. So the third is when a previous fetal malformation unrelated, you know, this was a doctor couple who had a previous child with left-sided CDH. And uh, they did everything for the child, a microarray, whole exome, everything came out to be normal. But they were so scared, they wanted a normal baby that they... After a detailed pre-test counseling, they opted for their testing. See, the wife is carrier for some, the husband is carrier for some, and they were both carrier for this RP, retinitis pigmentosa gene, but in one of them, it was a pathogenic variant, and in the other, for it was a VUS variant. So, but we know that we will not uh, be uh, offering prenatal for this scenario. So, here the prenatal post-test counseling becomes important. And the fourth case example is there is no previous history, but they opt for, again, this expanded screening because they are either planning an entirely normal pregnancy, they are well aware enough, they are going through IVF, or, you know, they are consanguineous, or because they are for inbreeding. Uh, there is history of some closely related marriage. So this is one example of that. Uh, previous no child, but, you know, they were carriers for this uh, gene. And, uh, and for the pathogenic variant in this gene and VUS in this gene. So for them, we uh, said that we can offer you prenatal for the first one and nothing would be done for the second one. So then uh, due to fertility issues, they went for PGTM and they now have a healthy baby. So this is a very nice paper which has recently come up. They say the ACOG and the ACMG say we should approach a four-tier system for the screening. Tier one is historical, that SMA, thalassemia. SMA we are not incorporating, but it's historical. 
historical according to them that you do cystic fibrosis, thalassemia, SMA, risk based for 21, NTD and family history based. This is historical. It should have been done, should be done. Tier two is that you include the tier one and you include autosomal recessive conditions with a carrier frequency of at least one in 100. Tier three is that X-linked plus one in 200. And ACO, ACMG and ACOG go up to tier three. Tier four is that you are screening for everything that we usually are doing in cases of previous children uh, and we don't have the records, but tier four can also be opted after a prenatal testing. So uh, this is very important. ACMG recommends tier three screening to all who wish to be pregnant or who, all who are currently pregnant, right? And tier three contains around 113 genes and it is equitable for all. And ACMG advises that tier four can be undertaken after a thorough uh, genetic uh, counseling or if there is a family history or there is a consanguinity or upon request. ACMG does not recommend routine tier four uh, because it would uh, usually increase the at-risk pregnancies and more invasive, but do not offer tier one and two because it's not inclusive for all. Tier three is what they are recommended recommending. So this is just a diagrammatic representation of what we've already discussed. We are actually, we, we are behind. The world is actually at the tier three right now. Just a list of all those diseases which, which have a high carrier frequency rate, autosomal recessive disorders, again, between one to 50 and one to 100, the X-linked diseases, which should be commonly looked at. So just the purpose of these slides is that just look, so many genes are there, which the, uh, these societies are telling us we should routinely look at. And uh, the carry home message, which I would want to say here is that for genetic disorders, an ounce of prevention is a worth a pound of cure because there is actually no cure. And carrier screening is a basic step to a healthier population. And uh, we should rise beyond thalassemia to SMA and uh, to probably to the tier three approach that the ACMG and ACOG have said and uh, with a good pre and postnatal counseling. And uh, this is going to, because collectively the disease, the, these disease burden is much higher as compared to the routine uh, Down syndrome and the neural tube uh, risk to where we, you know, put so much of our input into. So thank you, everyone. I will stop my share here. Thank you. Dr. Snehal, can I take up the Q&As now? Yeah, thank you, Minakshi. Thank you for excellent points made for screening for severe diseases, which can right away be pre uh, prevented before the pregnancy can happen, or at least, you know, one or two incidences and we can. It's excellent session, excellent points, uh, simple points made, yes. So, Aradhana, actually, we have, we should have introduced you. Aradhana is a young, <laughs> enthusiastic ob obstetrician practicing in Dule and uh, is uh, also trained in uh, scopies, but she was so helpful to give us inputs as to how to uh, get this into, uh, you know, simple platforms and simple clinical practice. So yes, Aradhna, you can take and we welcome Dr. Pramod Patil, who is experienced fetal medicine specialist at Nashik. Yeah. Go ahead, Aradhna, you can now have, you know, involve everybody in Q&A. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Sneha, Dr. Priya and Dr. Meenakshi, ma'am. So now we are a diverse group of OBGYN practitioners uh, among the participants. A lot of, a few are, the, uh, are, the, are practicing in Nasik and urban area, but we drain it from the surrounding rural areas. And the rest of us from Malegao, Jalgao and Dhule, uh, primarily a rural area. And also we cater to a lot of population from the tribal areas. Uh, this was a very, very uh, a big eye opener for all of us, even though uh, we go through journals and we see all these things, you know, in and out. But we really don't know how clinically relevant it is for our practice because we feel this is something that only the elite can afford. This is something that only the bigger cities, uh, you know, uh, should be catering to. But uh, as and when you started highlighting each and every case that you came across, we all we started having a sense of deja vu. Yes, we have had a case like this. Yes, we've had a case like this. And then we started feeling a sense of guilt. Probably if we had more knowledge or, you know, if we knew better, we could have helped the couple in some way. Uh, so the questions are also varied, right, from basics to the more uh, nuanced ones. A few of them are already answered, but for the sense of... Uh, Completion, let me just read out the question. The first question was, was by Dr. Yogita Patil. Uh, 
uh, Gravida 1 was a, a missed abortion. There was no cardiac activity. Gravida 2, the dual markers was uh, raised for trisomy 18 and 13. And then she was tra trying to plan a pregnancy. Um, uh, the second pregnancy was tested. Uh, we... Uh, Okay, so for the uh, for the previous pregnancies, both of them, the POCs were not tested for any chromosome and anomalies. There was no family history. There was no consanguinity. And uh, Dr. Yogita wanted to know what needs to be done. How do you proceed in the evaluation? Uh, Dr. Minakshi, I know you've already answered this, but can you uh, quickly just recapitulate what to do in such a case? Yeah, so if uh, ideally POC testing should be there, but uh, definitely mostly it is not there. So what we can do is that we can have a, a basic family, always start with the basic family history on either side, consanguinity on either side. If you know the mother has had miscarriages or the father's family had any neurodegenerative or any such a good detailed family history. Secondly, uh, what we can do as of now is a basic karyotype. We can, uh, a positive counseling is also very important that, you know, no, the age of the patient is very important. If it is a 40-year-old woman, I would expect more aneuploid losses as compared to in a 20-year-old woman. So I would say that if it's around a 30-year-old woman with two losses, no POC, microarray done, I would and nothing significant in the family history, I would say don't worry. Uh, because in 70% of the cases, because in 70% of these cases, this is, you know, these are sporadic de novo events. And let's get a basic karyotype done for you. And if it is okay, don't panic. And uh, let's for a good pregnancy with all the antenatal care but if something uh, 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 god forbid goes wrong then please do not miss a poc microarray in this pregnancy i just want to make one point aradhna that whenever you have first pregnancy loss you have done karyotype it is normal make it a point that in the second pregnancy if even if patient just efforts for karyotype or you just do karyotype you can one can do DNA storage from the POC right away when they collect the sample. DNA storage is available with Medgenome at a very minimum cost of one to two thousand rupees, depending on the period for which you store the DNA. And the importance of it in my practice, I have actually started off when five years back when the prices were or used to be high because gynecologist has to cater to MTP cost, you know, uh, the abortion cost, then the next day, investigations cost. So many of my couples took up DNA storage, which I worked on after six months when they come for the next pregnancy, came for next year and then DNA was stored. We evaluated that DNA and then addressed this pregnancy. So this definitive, you know, that is why these dialogues with the laboratory and genetics is important. And if there is a cost limitation and if there are previous reports normal, what can we right away do, even if they call from the lab room while doing MTP that is important. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so the next question is from the, uh, from Dr. Amod Mahajani, sir. Uh, he has asked uh, a patient, a uh, uh, fetus has only absent nasal bone as a sole entity, no other an anomaly. What will be the chances of abnormality after birth? Uh, now for answering this question, I would like, I would uh, request the organizers to uh, Dr. Pramod Patil, sir. He's a well-renowned fetal medicine specialist from Nasik. Uh, he's done his postdoctoral fellowship in fetal medicine at Mediscan, and presently he's working as director or uh, uh, as director of Fetus Day Clinic, Nasik. Uh, so, sir, uh, only isolated absent nasal bone, no other anomaly. Uh, is it associated? Uh, is it serious? First of all, and what should be done after that? Uh, isolated nasal bone, either major marker for Down syndrome. So we need to do an amniocentesis or if she is in the first trimester, we need to do CVS and get fish plus karyotype done for this pregnancy. Okay. Uh, now, because these are invasive procedures, I would uh, ask Dr. Uh, Snehal ma'am, uh, before we go in for either amnio or choreo, is uh, NIPT going to help us? Yes, yeah, so, so that is where the counseling whole session comes that one, two, up to 2% of absent bone is present in euploid pregnancies also. So that communication with the couple has to be made that this many percentage can still have euploid pregnancy, nothing to fear. Then you have two options. One is NIPS, which is at a, you know, gives reports within 10 days. So you can do NIPT with a surety because 13, 18, 21 nowadays, uh, uh, Dr. Priya has discussed about positive predictive, negative predictive 
value. And even in, in cases where couple wants to choose invasive like CVS or precious pregnancy, where you don't have to do NIPT and then CVS. So it is at a length discussion with the couple what they have to choose. And still, if after this, if everything comes normal, they should be assured that the pregnancy outcome is can be normal in many of these cases, but newborn has to be followed up with a gynecologist communication that we will see a normal scan, we will follow up this baby after birth, and that point has to be made with the patient, like, you know, absent nasal bone, single umbilical artery, some choroid plexus cyst, which I made in my presentation, that still single, single problems need to be addressed with a sonologist, fetal medicine specialist to look for other problems, whether there is any need for fetal 2D echo in some cases associated with single umbilical arteries. Then we should also make a point that if the investigations come normal, there are possibilities of premature deliveries, baby landing up, landing up into some renal problems or PU junction with uh, single umbilical artery, other problem, otherwise baby is fine. But if these problems are addressed in NIC or perinatally, then baby can be almost fine even if there is single umbilical artery. So there is a whole list of uh, communication with the patients made, sonologists to contribute with the, with the sonology features and gynecologist and pediatrician hand in hand. If everything comes normal to monitor these babies for a good pregnancy outcome and postnatal examination for any remaining abnormalities we need to search for. Right. Thank you. Uh, coming back to uh, Dr. Pramod Patil, sir. Uh, because, you know, a lot of uh, uh, obstetricians are conducting these scans on their own. Although uh, NT scans and anomaly scans, obviously only radiologists are doing, but uh, it is because you are an FMF expert, it is possible to check for the nasal bone in the 13-week uh, scan at the, at the NT scan itself. What are the pitfalls generally? Because there are a lot of times when the nasal bone is actually uh, present, but it is reported as absent because of very strict criteria. And uh, do you have any pointers, you know, how, how should this be confirmed that the nasal bone indeed is absent? Because just this one diagnosis that the radiologist uh, gives triggers a series of uh, questions and doubts in the minds of the parents and the obstetrician. So any more pointers from your end, whenever this nasal bone absence is reported in the sonography? When the nasal bone absent is reported in the sonography, we should see how the scan was performed. We should see the image whether it was done a strictly mid sagittal section where three points, nasal bone, skin, all these are present or not. And then if there are three lines uh, in the mid sagittal section at the level of the nasal bone, then only we can say that the nasal bone is present or absent. Now we are changing, most of the obstetricians have started doing scans on their own. If they are unable to do uh, get a perfect mid sagittal section, at least go in a coronal section and take the prenasal triangle or the re retro nasal triangle where you see the if the triangle is complete you can say that the nasal bone is present right thank you sir so whenever you get this diagnosis it is important to check for the images yourself if you are satisfied if you are convinced that this is indeed an absent nasal bone, then the series of investigations are triggered. And as Dr. Snehal Madam rightly pointed, the onus, you shift the onus from you. The, the patient is going to ask you, Dr. Sagra Vyavasthita hai na bayala kai problem ahe. It is very difficult to say at your end. Please involve the geneticist over here and let the counseling be taken over by people who are trained in this. All right. As Dr. Meenakshi has made a point, I have made a point that there are distribution of these features across spectrum of it. We are just concentrating on Down syndrome for absent nasal bone and where we are seeing syndromic patients with absent nasal bones in their pregnancy with other syndromes. Yes. So uh, if, you, if you, you know, confirm Down syndrome, but you land up with a baby with another syndrome in which absent nasal bone is there. So that detailed communication in one visit with the patient is there where they should be op offered all these choices and offered all these possibilities possibilities in this single case so they just don't run from you know fear from possibilities run from scan to scan run to you know triple quadruple nipt invasive and everything coming normal and still sanguine umbilical artery and landing up into premature baby or nic or iud's we have seen iud's is single umbilical arteries so yes so there is a lot of communication should be made in for that particular couple, for that particular case, how to proceed, at what gestation they have come to you, at what gestation you're doing the scans and how to involve other, other people. 
and and um, aradha i would like to make a point that medjuno is now catering to all uh, platforms so they have also included this clinical opinion platform so we are trying to connect to the obstetrician spinal medicines and sonologists where they can directly answer there you know there and patient square is right from their clinics to us on video or online platform so we are working out on the simple platforms to be directly connected to obstetricians and spinal medicine specialists and we want suggestions from all of you to get it a simpler online platform to be made to be connected to all of you that's a very important point ma'am because we as obstetricians are always caught between the blades of a scissor because we probably don't have the knowledge but when the patient is sitting in front of us in the opd we have to give them some answer so if there is some way we could connect to you there and there uh, that would make our workflow easier and that could also take some burden off of us and take some burden off the parents also just one right. thing that uh, you said that you are not knowledgeable but we are saying that you know primary physicians are more knowledgeable than us because they cater this nine months delivery see you see patients normal also and abnormal we may focus on some abnormalities so we need clues from this primary like dr minakshi has made a point you know some of them you know some of their family members having some history some of so these are the pointers made by gynecologists and the family to us so you are the point where we are just want to provide uh, you with the possibilities of questions to be asked finally i mean knowledge and no knowledge i mean we have to just share knowledge yeah yes thank you ma'am yeah and dr pramod you wanted to ask something ma'am when we are doing an nipt or a nips always the patient informed pre consent should be taken and it should be taken that it is a screening test and not a diagnostic test this has to be confirmed to the kepo yes yeah, so Next, that is when we are suspecting trisomy 18 and 13 always always tell the patient this test is only for trisomy 21 because the sensitivity of nipt is low for trisomy 13 and 18 it is almost 96% sensitive so all these things should be put on a paper consent should be taken pre pregnancy counseling letter should be put and the post counseling letter should also be put to the file of the patient exactly exactly we are because as uh, dr anur uh, aradhna has said that they are caught in you know caught in many problems at the desk about mtp is about legalization about documentation so yes that definitely important that you fill up this forms correctly and you do make it a point that you have done this counseling session on paper just telling no what points you have made it to the patient and what points you made it to the patient that they should be you know seek answers for later come back for anomaly scan come back for this so that should be put on paper yes rightly said so as obstetricians we are very uh, wary of uh, documentation because we already have enough of it but yes. uh, especially when you have this kind of something anomaly reported it's very important uh, that you document what you have told the patient because the patient is going to go doctor shopping he is going to she is going to go to some another doctor and kind of seek the answers look for the answer that she, he or she wants okay they might not want what you are they might, might not want might not like what you're telling them so it's very important to document what you have told them and in fact we were in talks with dr snehal ma'am and if the med genome guys can help us with that uh, a lot of western countries have patient information leaflets in their native languages so if we can come up with such information leaflets or information videos for patients that we can share there and there in the opd either on whatsapp or give them some leaflets which lays down these numbers the percentages in lay language something that the patient can understand in this region in marathi or at least bare minimum at least in hindi without too much of jargon then again our lives become easier so that you know we have put across what the what is important for the patient to know at the same time uh, the patients don't have any false expectations that that this was a screening test and if it has come back negative and unfortunately the baby turns out to be positive then the blame game does not start they make a informed decision uh based on their uh, intellect so this is a, a common you know a query that keeps coming about the counseling and the documentation of what counseling has been done so either patient information leaflets or videos would be a good starting point yeah so we have to make it simpler for the community we have started making simpler for doctors to be made right from screening to diagnosis but we have to also reach out to communities to make it simpler because of un you know over made fear of social networks has also that back uh, draw that you have fears into overblown proportions 
test made into overblown proportions over the counter, anybody taking NIPS and then don't know what to do next. So yes, we have to make the messages very specific, but still simpler. Right. Uh, Dr. Amod Mahajani had also posted the question about single umbilical artery, which Madam has already answered. Yes, it can be associated with trisomies 13, 18. It can be associated with prematurity, growth restriction, and adverse neonatal outcomes. Uh, the key point here is counseling. And if you think it is not possible for you to deal with it yourself, please involve a multidisciplinary team. Uh, moving on to the... Um, Next question uh, by Yogita Patil, Madam, again. NIPT or invasive, which is better if dual or quadruple shows abnormalities? If NIPT shows normalcy, can we give 100% assurance to patient? We can never give 100% assurance, but again, reiterating what uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Snehal Ma'am and Dr. Pramod Patil sir had uh, mentioned, it is important for them to know the percentages and, it is, and then it is the patient's prerogative which test is it that they are uh, willing to go forward with. And for that matter, even amnio and choreo uh, CVS will not be 100% because there are uh, false negatives in those tests also. Uh, am I right, sir? Dr. Pramod Patil, sir. Can we get a 100% answer with even amnio and CVS? Yeah, yeah. We can assure them that whatever has been seen for a small percentage of laboratory errors has to be mentioned. Otherwise, Almost it is 100%. Yes. No, but I, do, I don't see any chance, Aradna, to do quadruple now. See, dual marker you're doing, you're doing NIPTs. And after that, if you have query or a positive test, high risk on NIPT, you go on to do CVS or amniocentesis. So it is 100% for trisomy 13, 18, 21. So the target for 13, 18, 20, if it is there, it is 100 for it. So you can't say that this can't be 100%. See, it's like, you know, 100% uh, every, everything you have, aware, we have mask, you have sanitizer, you have everything, you have vaccine, you're not going to get corona. So to kuch nahi hai. Patients ask us, if madam, we have screened for DMD, we have screened for thalassemia. What about any other rare disease coming into our baby? So that that we are not never able to, you know, assure. What about then premature birth? What about then stillbirth or IUD? So it is a about the specific test to be made in that particular couple for specific risk. And if that risk is eliminated, 1% background population risk is with every normal couple for many of this genetic condition, which you are not going to take out. But as Dr. Meenakshi has rightly made, that if there are any fears related to rarest of the rare disorders, you can directly apply genetic screening for carrier testing of rare disorders to these couples. So that is why the dialogue that lead should be started that any fear related to rarest of rare disorders, we have right away at preconception screening which can be offered at least you start the dialogue or leaflets as you rightly said to be available to the couple so that there is no gap in the communication that this was not told to by the doctor we have made the communication that preconceptional testing or screening test is available and now patient coming to the pregnancy and they also knew that it was you know told by the doctor that preconceptional was available we didn't take it so yeah right um so, uh, Dr. Yogita Patil, I hope that answers your query. Uh, again, in the Western world, NIPT is not uh, offered everywhere. Uh, and some of them also go in for something called as contingent testing. Only if the dual marker is come shows a high result, then instead of straight away going for an invasive test, they offer NIPT. But with the patient being fully aware of the pitfalls and advantages and disadvantages of all the uh, uh, tests. Moving on to the next question, again by Dr. Amod Mahajani, sir. What are the chances of having anomaly in ART cycle? Is it less than normal conception? If yes, and uh, why? Uh, uh, yeah. can, I, can I have Dr. Minakshi, ma'am, answer this question? Uh, uh, thank you for the question. So, uh, in the ART, uh, previously, the previous literature used to actually say that the ART cycles are more at risk of having anomalous ba babies. So, the, uh, five or ten years back, we were reading Beckford Friedman syndrome is higher in IVF babies, and nucleoidy rates are higher. But you know, the literature has said that no, it's equal. It was just kind of a bias, but definitely not less. It must be equal to normal pregnancy, but not less. So, you cannot say that uh, let's have an IVF baby so that your risk of having a genetic disorder would be less. That would not be okay. 
the correct thing to say. So it would be equitable risk for a normal or ART. But if yes, if you're taking for ART, uh, uh, like you need to take a good family history. And if you're taking donors, you have to have genetic screening for the donors as well. But definitely not a decreased risk for genetic disorders just because it's an ART site. Right. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, again, Dr. Yogita has asked another question. If the POCs show chromosomal abnormalities like deletion or duplication, where there is risk of recurrence, how to counsel patient, what will be the next level intervention? Although, uh, again, MDT, but uh, specifically over here, when there is a POC, it has showing deletion, duplication, how do you go forward? So it, it, it actually depends if it is, you know, an isolated, uh, like if it's, uh, I see a cry to shake deletion i see a 4p uh, uh, arm deletion so i know it, uh, it it will not usually reoccur but in those cases also due to germ something called germline mosaicism we offer an amniocentesis in the next pregnancy but you say that the risk of reoccurrence is less than one percent but for that also we have scans to look and amniocentesis to look for it but if there is something like i see a deletion on chromosome 11 and one gain on 17 so this some this is a double segment imbalance i start thinking that one of the parents will have a translocation between 11 and 17 so i go back for a parental karyotype so uh, here in double segment Im imbalances involving two different chromosomes, the risk of reoccurrence would be as high as 40 to 50 percent because one of them is a ca uh, carrier. So uh, it's better to refer these cases for detailed counseling and testing to a geneticist, preferably or a fetal medicine person. And uh, based on it, but it's never 100 percent. So it, they have a good prognosis. And uh, based upon the etiology, you can go for a CBS, AMNU, or PGT SR, structure for SR or A. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next question is from Dr. Kamal Patil. How do you interpret the HPLC report? This is a very basic and a very common question. A lot of us do not know how to interpret even the dual marker test because there's so much information given. So yes, these days now your, uh, the uh, labs have come up with simpler interpretation boxes. How do you interpret the HPLC report? Uh, who would like to take this question? Meenakshi, you have discussed thalassemia. So, oh, HPLC, okay. you know, you have to discuss yeah. thalassemia as you can. So, yeah. HPLC, the first thing that I, I always say that don't be, it should not be isolated HPLC. There should be RBC indices, MCV, MCH, MCHC. RBC count hemoglobin. So it should, you, you should have two pages of it, right? So first thing, look at the hemoglobin first. It should be in the normal range. Look at the MCV, MCH. If they are around 80s to 90s, I will be happy. Then go into the RBC count. It's okay or not. Then go to the HbA2f levels. And usually below the HPLC, you know, the lab, if it's a good lab, it would have given you the interpretation. HbA2 is very, very important. Uh, as a geneticist, I am worried if it's more than 3 or 3.5%, but labs have their own standardization. So if HbA2 is more than 3.5% and MCV is around 69, 70, it's bold, it's abnormal. It's a, uh, it's, if HbA2 is around 5 to 6%, it's a beta thal minor trait. But, but always look uh, if there is any other peak, because it's not only HB, there could be HbD peak there could be HBS peak. So in HPLC, they will give you in the interpretation that it is suggestive of a sickle cell trait. It is suggested of HBD. It, uh, so for those, these are hemoglobin variants, which are usually innocuous. Uh, but for them, uh, depending if you encounter such thing, order for the spouse uh, HPLC. And uh, whatever the gestation is, on the basis of that, you might have to go for the Sanger sequencing hemoglobin as well. So if you encounter abnormal report, first thing to do is uh, order for the spouse and refer the patient, you know, for the uh, further action, uh, because you will have variants HBQ. So always to three main points here, look at MCV, MCH, MCHC, they should if in the lower range, even if the HbA2 is low. This is a very important point. If your MCV, MCH, MCHC is low and HbA2 is in the normal range, these thalassemia trait carriers can be masked due to iron deficiency. So here also, the safest way is do a spouse testing or, you know, supplement iron for some time and repeat HplC. Yes, so, so simple few points that we have 
CBC, we have peripheral smear, we have HPLC. So on CBC, you see if there is microcytic hypochromic anemia and then differentiate whether it is, and there is a menser index which, which is calculated in thalassemia uh, patients to distinguish them. So if it is microcytic hypochromic, go on to differentiate and deficiency and thalassemia and then you have HPLC. And we are also getting concurrent, you know, indices with, uh, because of vitamin B12 deficiencies. So definitely you have to correlate peripheral smear, the MCV, MCH indices, and HPLC to come to a conclusion whether it is really concurrence of iron deficiency thalassemia, concurrence of deficiencies, or only thalassemias, or only thalassemia carriers, because thalassemia carriers are also important for gynecologists to manage in the pregnancy. In the later pregnancy, third gestation, they have to manage well. Right. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, Dr. Kamal, for this important question. We in Khandesh are a, a sickle cell uh, belt. So this interpretation of this report plays a very important uh, part in our clinical practice. And I would say, whenever in doubt, please call the pathologist. It is the lab's duty to make things easier for you. So if there is any query, any concern, always ask the pathologist uh, or the concern lab. Uh, then moving on, uh, there is a question that I had from my side related to uh, 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 hemoglobinopathies. A lot of, we are only, for, as far as uh, red cell antigens are concerned, we only test for rhesus. Uh, is, and we know for a fact that there are other antigens like C, E, Kelly, which uh, also affect, uh, which can also cause, uh, can affect the fetus. Is there any way uh, we can test for them in India? So a minor blood group antigen testing is available at very specialized centers, usually the ones which have transfusion medicine department. So it is available. But usually, you know, these incompatibilities usually do not lead to high drops or uh, uh, very severe neonatal jaundice. But uh, I have had few patients where there was, you know, all hydropic pregnancies, which cannot be autosomal recessive and all uh, RH incompatibility was not there. So there we actually saw a few cases of these uh, I, uh, isoimmunization with the C and the Kelly factors. So uh, it is routinely possible. ICT positive patient should be there and you should give all the information to the labs. The labs with the specialized transfusion medicine do do it. But usually they will not cause very severe incompatibilities and features. And, and this rare antigens, no, KM hospital 13th floor NIH is offering it as a, a 2500. So you have rarest of the rare case where you have to do antigen studies. You have to have, you know, fetal thrombocytopenia, maternal gestational thrombocytopenias, you are suspecting antigens. These tests are available sometimes free on a research basis or at a very lower cost in KEM hospital, 13th floor with NIH. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next question again is by Dr. Kamal Patil. What tests to offer in ECS for expanded carrier screening? Which tests exactly? Uh, so for expanded carrier screen, we at Medgenome are offering three tires. So first is the gold panel we call it and the third is the uh, basically in expanded carrier screen you are offering a uh, clinical exome the ngs based testing so uh, depending upon the uh, patient's need what you are offering is a next generation you actually are not audible There is a glitch, I think, or a slow internet, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Me, uh, am I audible right now? Slow oh, internet, maybe. Yeah, Meenakshi, we're not. Uh, oh, so, sorry. I'll repeat it. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah. Yes, yes you are. Yeah. So, uh, expanded carrier screening. Again, again, not audible. I, I'll type in. I think I'll type. Yeah. I'll type okay. But it is available in stages. Meenakshi, what is trying to say is it is available in stages like 100 important genes in India, 500 genes, 1000 genes, both carrier couples are only one tested and another that are tested later on. So it depends on the scenarios, the patients which is asking, the affordability of the couple and the disorders for which they are seeking. So, you know, you have a lot of choices available depending on your practice setup. Okay, all right. Uh, now, Dr. Ashutosh is asking the question, why not microarray for amnio? Uh, Dr. Ashutosh, it would be better if you could expand a little more. But uh, yes, this is, even if we are advising, uh, you know, amnio or CVS, 
what test do you want to be performed on that particular sample is also a question that a lot of us gynecologists don't know so can you expand on that which uh, tests which methods of tests can be done on the amnio samples microarray is a first year of testing in western world aradhna so they are not just doing a karyotype even in my practice i am offering karyotype plus microarray to high risk pregnancies and to pregnancies who have had because i have a recent incidents last week first baby affected with urea cycle defect is posted for liver transplant and now second pregnancy showed hypoplastic left heart syndrome so this before the anomaly scan detected we we would have done also urea cycle defect of the fetus and also by microarray you can uh, see micro deletions because it was offered because it was a precious pregnancy already first child you have to take care of and you should not so microarrays for uh, in a low resolution is a first year testing in western world that they are directly going and that is recommended as I mean, actually, has discussed many guidelines. So slowly, as prices come down, I think this will be routine in India also. At least for high-risk couples or previously affected babies. Uh, so I hope that answers your query, Dr. Ashutosh. But if you need further clarification, either uh, unmute yourself or uh, type in your query. Yeah, you can unmute and discuss. Many of you, yeah. All right. Uh, again, he has posted hypoplastic nasal bone. I don't understand the query, but I believe this has already been answered. Uh, uh, Dr. Pramod, sir, is there anything called as hypoplastic nasal bone or is it just absent or present? Is there something called as hypoplastic nasal bone, sir? Probably Dr. hypoplastic <laughs> nasal bone, unossified nasal bone, absent nasal bone, you should consider one and the same. Once it is, and you should investigate accordingly. Right. Yeah, it's not. It it doesn't decrease decrease the risk or make the question milder. That is what Dr. Pramod is saying. You know, you have to take it as an a high risk content or a soft marker and see as we have discussed earlier. In view of that, you have to discuss the abnormality. A lot of radiologists uh, always want to play it safe, and uh, a lot of times they want to avoid counselling because the. The patient will directly ask them, "Sir, go baro barahe na doctor." And uh, when they say something like hypoplastic nasal bone, again the onus comes on the obstetrician. What to tell the patient is abnormal, normal what? They have re recorded, they have reported what they wanted to report. So interpretation again is the onus is on us, and we have to be sure. There's no such thing as hypoplastic nasal bone. The nasal bone is a present or absent, and for it to be present, there are very strict criteria. and if those criteria are not there uh, even if it is reported as hypoplastic nasal bone it is still a risk factor there is some a priori risk attached to it and that needs to be investigated i hope that answers your query we are standing on the bridge aradhna between you between sonologist and the laboratory to make you an understandable answer so yes we are trying to bridge the gap and we are ready with all of you to work together to address such patients and queries directly when they come to you So with that, I don't have any more questions in the Q and A tab. But uh, I would like to open the floor for the rest of the participants. If there are any more queries uh, specifically to genetics that you would like answered, uh, kindly unmute yourself or type in your queries. We'll wait for probably five more minutes. Until then, there are some queries which I have from my side personally. uh which i have felt from my own practice and i i'm hoping this could uh, help the rest of the practitioners also so uh we have dr. a patient dr sanjukta has raised the hand dr sanjukta okay uh dr sanjukta can you please unmute yourself please dr sanjukta sahu can you please unmute yourself or uh uh the it team is it possible for you to unmute her Uh, we have given the permission uh, to unmute. Ma'am has to unmute. You can me. unmute, unmute everybody because we have five minutes left, and we can. You know, anybody can raise and uh, answer the query if they can unmute it. They can be unmuted from your end. You can go on, Aradhna. We have just some time right. left. Yeah. Right. Uh. So. one question that i'm sure each and every practitioner here has is how much exactly is the cost for each of these tests that you have mentioned okay because uh, once we have a patient you know it is very difficult i'm sure a lot of practitioners will agree with me even if we write in the routine anc profile if we write tsh which costs just 600 to 700 rupees still the patients will raise a query ki why did you order this test my previous obstetrician 
who's probably just a BUMS or BHMS does not know what an ANC profile is, did not uh, order this test. Why is it that you're ordering such costly tests for me? Okay, so we need to know what is the spectrum uh, of the complexity of the test, which we understood from your lecture, but what are the cost implications for uh, the gynecologist and for the patients? Yes, so it is a discussion again, I, I would say personalized because you see some families losing babies and abortions, going through IUIRT cycles, they have already lost money. So the obstetrician always has a say that if you have lost all this money, why not take up the test? And for the population who is really not affording, the message is awareness, awareness and keep telling them about the choices for the population who is affording but because they are thinking ki kya hai normal hai na, makashala karai, sir. so for them also awareness and start offering screening testing and every gynecologist if is on the same page that these are the guidelines these are the screening test in your vicinity why a patient will listen from everybody the same right so it's not about you see we can't be comparable to other uh, streams of medicine who are offering something less and getting into you know because bms i mean i'm not i don't want to label anybody but we can't compare with the other streams of medicine let it be restricted to our stream of medicine where we want to be on one platform one single platform form our own guidelines for our societies which should help that even if it is a costly testing what is the what are the benefits work on the other possibilities how can we minimize for that particular family that is where case to base case based discussion is i would just give an example there is a very less affording couple coming to me yesterday from a very remote part of maharashtra three uh, girls lost uh, previously no money at all and there is one big deletion in the previous baby found who has died now so what we have done at med genome is now we are going to not offer karyotype we will do just dual marker to screen for aneuploidies and we will only do amniocentesis and that particular deletion to cut the cost. And the couple is ready even if they are not affording because they have lost three babies. So case to case basis, yes. But if we start generalizing the cost, I think that would not be good enough because we cater to a lot of types of patients, you know, and we can't keep holding on patients who visit other streams because anyway yeah, they're going to go there so what yes. is there is you have to just combine this platform to give a simple common message and if we keep doing that there is one day it will come that everybody starts realizing that you know they have uh, suffered maybe their peers have suffered it's not that they want to have a healthy baby we want to also prevent you know corona is not that will catch up only healthy person if I am protected, I am protected. Everybody is at stake. So everybody should be informed about risks. So even if no family member, family member, there are options available and please take it. So message, giving message and continuous is will that will help. And if you say tribal areas and non-affording, definitely we can work out on the cost and the options in that particular patient. So just scans, or you know, specialists like Dr. Pramod can guide. Ki acha madhe scan varna kaay karu shakto, and scan varna kiti jasta risk deu shakto. Right. So uh, there is a question by Dr. Bina Nai, and it is a question that all of us face day in and day out in our uh, office. If uh, there is a blighted ovum, then from the next pregnancy, how do you go about it? Because they will ask, why did this happen? We always tell them it is very common. One in five pregnancies end up in miscarriages. Most common cause of aneuploidy. There is a, there in, in all probability, this will not happen again. But uh, now we have a lot of educated couples coming in. The woman is uh, taking her, you know, taking a first chance after the age of 30. She's climbing the corporate ladder. She wants to be sure what to expect next in her uh, next pregnancy. Uh, if she's, you know, if she's been through, even if it's a blighted dough, even if they know it's very common, and uh, we also know that there's nothing much that we can do, but a uh, lot of women want definitive answers. What can we tell them? How do you go about planning next pregnancy? Yeah, Minakshi is there. I think uh, inclusion of Minakshi's topic and Priya's topic is uh, what we wanted to expand the message that we have screening right from preconception where there are no answers. 
we have option of pgd available when after one blighted ovum because the woman is educated doesn't want to undergo abortions because of any aneuploidies so just do a screen a screen ivf and pgd so i'm definitely good cup i mean many couples are taking it up i mean don't take it granted that because it is costing 1.52 lakh they 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 know that they will visit two two three doctors ioi and they are going to have the same cost so please offer these options to couples and meenakshi has rightly said those messages that blighted ovum and the uh, Uh, association with other genetic abnormalities and abortions we they already known so we have many options on cards even after one blighted ovum right uh so i guess uh, that is all uh, all the questions in the q and a can add, and minakshi can add if she has seen blighted ovums with other causes if she has seen madam okay. this is dr priyadarshini i just wanted yeah, uh, dr priyadarshini yeah, yeah. Dr. Snail, I just wanted you to clarify one thing to the audience: is that you know many times for prenatal testing, we get this request that you know can you directly do in the fetus? So can you please explain to the audience why directly do going into the fetus is never a good idea, and we actually need a genetic diagnosis to uh, to go into the fetus either in the parents or the previous proband? Yes, Dr. Priya rightly made. I we didn't include neither Minakshi nor me about fetal exome studies. Uh, because uh, there are many requests coming ki pehla adhi to sagal negative wala and now this pregnancy is showing abnormality just do exome you know just do this but there are limitations of inter interpreting directly doing in this pregnancy some of the diagnoses so previous child diagnoses carrier testing of parents is important because directly doing fetal uh, uh, testing has so many limitations and interpretation problems sometimes we land up in problems that the report is very ambiguous and no decision to be made on mtps then why waste 50 60000 rupees so we land up in such situation so fetal exomes there are very few uh, recommendations currently by american society of uh, genomic genetics and genomics uh, where fetal exomes can can be discussed i am not saying applied can be discussed but apart from that definitely as dr priyadarshini has said that we have to do carrier screening or we have to do previous child testing and applied screening and then if we have we can discuss these options but very limited role as of now with the current guidelines Yeah, so I will just want to say in here uh, uh, for fetal exomes, if you are going getting an ultrasound anomaly which is you know suggestive of a typical syndrome, uh, go ahead with it. It's very fruitful. If you have a family history, previous child is ex uh, expired, try to convince them for a trio analysis, parents plus fetus. It really increases our confidence as a lab, and it makes uh, life easier for all of us. and uh, still in positive family history we can take up but you know autism somewhere in family previous child autism you are not studying the autism baby somebody in the family has and you send a direct fetal exome it's opening up a pandora's box and it's 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 going to cause haywire so structural anomaly in fetus previous history of uh, family history of some genetic disease parents carrier definitely go for fetal exomes but for the other very vague indications if you want to go go for a trio analysis Yeah, parents so that is, is yeah. why and also yeah ma'am there is also one uh, big question is that you know so for example for thalassemias and hemoglobinopathies the hplc is considered as a diagnostic test but when we are doing a prenatal testing for any hemoglobinopathy we still want a parental diagnosis of the mutation uh, this is very important because one i will just uh, narrate one case here uh, we had done hplc of both parents repeated twice and both were found to be carriers but in one of the parents we couldn't identify the mutation mm -hmm. so in this case had we done the fetus directly it would have led to a false positive or a false negative result so uh, before doing the fetus it is very important to know the mutation in the parents especially for single gene disorders where we know that there is a history in the family yeah definitely definitely rightly made out and i would like to make a point aradhna that because such queries are coming from the genetic laboratories that खरोखरच हे पेरेंट्स कॅरियर होते की नाही वेदर देव कॅरियर स्टेटस इन द अँड दॅट इज वाय वी आर गेटिंग क्वेरीज फॉर पॅटर्निटी टेस्टिंग रिसेंटली द पॅटर्निटी टेस्टिंग क्वेरीज हॅव हॅव इन्क्रीज 
uh, because of a lot of social problems, because of IVFs, because of overwhelming sperm donations, paternity testing is being offered by select laboratories with permissions. Earlier, it used to be only legal permissions and magistrate court, but now it is selectively available with some of the laboratories. So these uh, testing sometimes help to differentiate between this uh, problem related to you know fathers and mother carrier. That is a legal uh, part of it. But as Priya Darshan has made out, that sometimes some uh, queries come as to false positivity, false negativity, comparison with trio exome, comparison with father mother carrier status. So such uh, things can only be discussed with the laboratory and the clinicians to make uh, some sense out of it. All right. So, uh, so basically, uh, this just brings us to the conclusion that we know so little, and uh, we cannot, as obstetricians, we are the primary point of contact between uh, for the patient. We are the bridge uh, for the geneticists, and it is our duty to direct the patient in the right path. We are not God, and we should not play one. We can never give a very definitive yes or no answer, although the patient will sit on your head for a yes or no answer. But it is our duty to lay down the facts and uh, based on the patient's intellect and what the patient requires, they need, they need to make a decision, an informed decision based on the available facts. And, uh, you know, as obstetricians, there are already so many responsibilities on our shoulders. We are responsible for bringing down the maternal mortality, the maternal anemia rates, the infant mortality. Uh, now, I think uh, we all agree that it is also our responsibility to present to a, a healthier generation uh, for India, a, a healthier generation uh, to the future, so that uh, we are uh, bringing lesser and lesser babies with problems. It is the cost of bringing up a baby or a, or a child with some disability. It's enormous. It cannot be measured tangibly, financially, emotional burden. It, it, it is not, you know, only a family which has gone through bringing up such kind of a, a baby can understand uh, the burden. And it is something, it, it, as a, uh, obstetricians, it is our responsibility that no family has to undergo this burden, whether it's financial or emotional. And this is where the cause benefit uh, uh, counseling can come into play. We have so many patients, you know, who spend uh, thousands and thousands of rupees on uh, Dohal Jevan, on um, naming ceremonies, baby showers. And then when you talk about importance of these testing, they will always uh, think twice. But as obstetricians, I think the responsibility lies on us. There is a clear we charge, have, no? Okay. Am I audible? Yeah, audible. audible. Okay. So what I was saying as obstetricians, it is our responsibility that we show the correct paths to the patient and they are not just going round and round in circles. And uh, I uh, really thank Med Genome, Dr. Snehal, Dr. Priya and Dr. Minakshi for uh, enlightening us. And uh, on behalf of the OBGY societies of Nasik, Mal Malegao, Dhule, and Jalgao, uh, really heartfelt gratitude to the three of you. Thank you, Aradna, actually, to hold session. And in spite of a little longer addressing so many queries, uh, catering to all, the, all these queries, and Dr. Pramod for coming and sharing his uh, expertise from UHG abnormality. So, and we hold on to this um, uh, uh, to conclusion that uh, this is not the end. Uh, the, there are many queries, platforms are evolving, costs are evolving, and the science is evolving. So we look forward to more interactions, even if they're case-based scenarios, and we'll work for it with all of you. And please do give us suggestions for that. Thank you. Thank you, Nai Saradna. Thank you, ma'am. There's a reminder for all the participants that there will be a Google uh, form, a, a questionnaire that will be sent. And if you have any individual queries, you can address them to the uh, uh, panel later on also. And please Thank do you. give us suggestions to make it simpler. Yeah, we want them. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Arata. Yeah, we'll leave for the day today. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Pramukh Have a